Theodore, the island style, and we're looking at this herd of elephants in the western fringes of the great Kruger National Park. We're also going to be coming to you live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya, the Kalahari in northwestern South Africa with any luck, and northern Maputa land on the northeast coast of South Africa during the course of the next four hours. Please do talk to us using the hashtag CGTNWild and the hashtag WildEarth on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. You can send us any questions or any comments that you might have. We need to sneak a little bit further forward, see if we can get a better view of these elephants. They are behind quite a lot of bush. Bush that they are eating. Let's get a bit of a view there. Oh, and there's a tiny baby there. Hopefully that one will come out. Hey guys, I don't know why she's on her belly. She just put her head up. The wildebeest are not far at all, but looks like she's been eating very, very, very well. They're only about 60 feet, about 90 feet, oh, sorry, and any time she might go, but at the same time, she's very full. This time of the year, they can be very choosy. Normally, she would have gone a long time. But who says anything? Lion is still a cat, and even with a belly full, they will still go for more. I have seen, you know, lions with more than one kill. When they, you know, the moment prevails itself, they will make more than one kill. Remember? Yes, um, we are on the migration time, and as you can tell, there is plenty or very many young ones with very interesting looking horns. They are very straight. Those ones were born in February. And so they are making their first migration or maybe their first journey to the Masai Mara. This is part of the experience they go through, going through tall grass and also being when you know they get ambushed this is part of all learning look at that little guy can you imagine if he knew the lion was there he would not be there from the southern plains of the serengeti over a million grazers move northwest through the western corridor gathering along the banks of the grameti river once the chaos of the rut comes to an end the herds gallop north once again in time more than two million animals amount to feast on the abundance the Mara has to offer. But the reward of the red oat grass does not come easy. The zebra vanguard is the first on the banks, taking the plunge into the treacherous Mara River in order to reach the untouched long grass plains on the other side. Not only must they face the turbulent waters, but also the crocodiles gliding through the rapids in anticipation. Then comes the body of the migration, the thundering herds of the white-bearded wildebeest, with their bleeds echoing through the landscape while in search for greener pastures. Hunger, so too are the lions of the Mara, who patrol the banks of the river. The risks are known, but the herds are determined. All must make the leap. Some will fall, but for the survivors, the lush greenery that awaits is bountiful. And then, as is nature's way, it comes the time to cross the river again as they continue to follow the life-giving storms and nourishing plains. Certainly everybody does need to eat out here in the wild. It's a beautiful circle, the way that there's prey and predators 
and even the trees there's so much competition the trees and constant competition it's just awesome my name is Trishal and I've got BK on camera this morning I'm a little distracted because we are trying to follow up on a leopard and that's why we have a bit of a, a rolling start this morning and that is that's part of the journey, isn't it? To not actually see any animals, but actually find them. So we're looking for tracks of a female, possibly a female named Shadulu. They came all the way from the north to the south. Now tracking can be quite difficult. And in this weather, predators like to move around. So the most important thing we need is to actually hear the prey species, things like, like wildebeest or impala or kudu, letting us know there's a predator on the move and they go ba 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 ba. That's what we're listening out for. So we're going to keep on tracking. Hopefully, we'll find this leopard for you. Good morning from a very cloudy, overcast day here at Pridelands Eco Training. Good morning from a very cloudy overcast day here at Pridelands Eco Training. But that doesn't seem to be bothering the giraffe too much as they are still up and doing their normal things. My name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is Sebastian Romby. And we are not only going to be looking for the tallest mammal, but we're also going to be looking for some lions which we heard calling maybe about 20 minutes ago. But let's have a quick look at some of the giraffe. Oh, here's a nice one standing next to a marula tree which is a nice comparison so you can actually see how tall they get and don't you just love the contrast of the dying sort of tawny grass all the trees have lost their leaves except the one that the giraffe is feeding on i wonder what type of tree that is hmm interesting ah it looks like it's maybe one of the one of the spike thorns looks like it's potentially a spike thorn which is a tree that doesn't ever lose its leaves. And I think the giraffe is very, very happy to have some greenery in its life because it's all going to be maybe a few months before we get the rain and it revitalizes the bush. But look how long her neck is. And if we watch very carefully, we might even be able to see her swallow the ball of cud, well, the chewed up leaves that she's eating. Let's see if we can see that because that could be quite cool. Mel, yes, giraffe are magnificent creatures, and especially when you get to see the peristalsis, sort of the movement of the food going up and down that very, very long neck. It can actually be quite comical, but maybe not today. Maybe we're going to have to wait for it to regurgitate some um, partially digested food. But we know with these giraffe are, so we can always come back at some point and, and see what they get up to. They might even go down for a drink. They're not too far away from a dam. And also all the birds are just starting to wake up. Starting to hear more and more tweets and twitters in the distance. And I'm probably going to sit quietly now to hear if we can hear those lions. We have got a lovely herd of elephants here. And they are feeding beneath a big shot here tree. And there's a little one, two very little ones, and then the rest looking after the little ones. Different from the herd of elephants we began with yesterday morning. A little bit calmer, I would say. And they're kind of mixing their feeding between trees and grasses. That little one sampling all sorts of different foods as he transfers from a milk-based diet to a diet based on just about any vegetation that there is out here. It's important to remember that their feeding is not indiscriminate. They don't just eat anything. They're quite selective, although they have a very wide variety of foods. Kevin, yes, elephants do tend to be left or right tusked, in the same way that you are left or right-handed. And you can see that quite often in older elephants because what happens is one tusk wears down faster than the other. And sometimes one tusk breaks. But I don't think that it's a case of them being unable to use one tusk or the other. 
they just tend to use one more predominantly than the other. So if the dominant one breaks off, there's no reason that they shouldn't use the other one. You can hear a whole lot more coming through from the right, and it's a slightly you know, sort of intimidating feeling because I can't actually see them because the bush is so thick, but I can hear them coming. That's what this little one's looking at. Jumbo Jumbo, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Master Mara. I'm on one side of the Mara, while my friend Isaac is on the other side, and we've got a lioness there that's just disappearing in the grass. If you look carefully, you could have seen it go in right there. My name is David, and with me on camera this morning is Bungay. Nice to have all of you, and we just want to quickly find out what her plans are or what she wants to do, but I'm thinking she might be looking for some breakfast. So she's in that tall grass there that we call the elephant grass, and luckily James was having a young elephant eating grass. Not sure what type of grass she was eating. Elizabeth, you'd like to know if lions do hunt alone. Yes, Elizabeth, I'll tell you, the females are very good hunters. Even one lioness single-handedly, it's very easy for them to hunt. But in general, Elizabeth, I'll tell you, they always go as a pride because, of course, it's a lot easier to bring a prey down if you get three, four lionesses going for a big animal, for example, a buffalo. Well, one lioness, Elizabeth, can very easily go for a zebra or four wildebeest. They are very good hunters. Males, Elizabeth, very unusual to see a single male making its own kill unless it's hunting a prey that, you know, an old buffalo or a sick, you know, a sick animal like a zebra or a wildebeest. But in general, lionesses are very sharp, quick, and they'll just do the chase or lay ambush and bring down any prey of some sort, be it a zebra or a wildebeest. Well, I'm very close to the Mara River, and what I want to do is just to get there. Oh, she just came out again from the grass. Oh, there she is. There are two of them, and this particular pride belong to a pride or a group that we call the Mogoro pride. The two sisters normally, so we had seen the sister earlier, the sister is in one direction, I would say about a hundred meters from where that one is. Sometimes they're just browsing the grass, you know, looking for things. Uh, not once we have seen lionesses even eating chicks, you know, or for little birds in the grass, for example, guinea hens, should they find some, or many lapwings that will always hatch on the ground. We have always seen them browse the grass. If they, for example, get a scrub hair that is hiding somewhere there, it will quickly go for breakfast. Now, the tree line that you see there, that is the Mara River, and that's basically my destination today. I'll hang out around that area, and hopefully we might see some wildebeest coming to cross. Yeah, that's her there, slowly weaving in the grass. So I just want to move forward in front of her, and maybe go wait for her in the river. You never know what plants uh, she got. Hello guys and welcome. What I've just done is I've driven further down and turned the vehicle to face a different direction. The main reason is I want it to be as natural as possible. So now we're almost about 100 meters which is 300 feet from where we were before you can see we have moved and the main reason I wanted is not to attract any attention so that it happens naturally. I'm all alone but you're seated back, you know, back there, you are with me. Thank you. So I'm sitting here. The wildebeest are starting to, you know, walk back towards the lioness. One thing I realized is she has made a kill during the night. She has eaten almost half of it. That's why she had that full belly. But it doesn't mean that she won't go. Yes, I'm talking about you, lioness. So she will need to have the wildebeest as close as possible because she's already tummy full. 
Remember, this is coming live from the Mara Triangle in the Masai Mara. This is migration time, and it is like Christmas for these lions. Look at that, we have moved quite a distance. We want it to happen as natural as possible. Anything happening, we won't miss because Big James is tracking everything with his, you know, um, big lens. Look at this. You know, they are so oblivious, they actually have no clue what is just about to hit them. Just milling around. Remember, they arrived here last night. They are moving closer and closer towards their destination. This long grass is what attracts them. And, you know, they are having it big time. Morel, you asked me if we haven't seen the sausage tree pride yet. No. Unfortunately, we don't have coverage for that area, but we will be, you know, doing that in the next coming weeks. Uh, remember, they're quite a distance away from us. Um, we haven't seen them yet, but um, I'm sure we will be updating you in the coming weeks. Yeah, we know they are, you know, everybody loves the sausage tree pride. I have words that they are all intact, 14 of them. So don't you worry, it's a matter of time and we will share them with you. So before they see all of the prides in the Mara, we are here on and beyond Gala this morning and welcome to all our viewers. And at the moment we are in the Timbavati riverbed. And as you can see, no immediate sign of life. Good morning, I'm Yapi and behind the camera we have Gareth this morning. And we're currently busy checking the riverbed for any signs of any animals, elephant, maybe some lions. The lions were in this area yesterday and we're hoping that we might be able to pick up on any signs of them. It's a bit of a windy morning this morning and a bit of an overcast day. We even felt a drop or two earlier, so it's a little bit cold for animals and I think because of that it might be slightly more tricky to find animals this morning. So I think we're going to continue and head up the bank and check the floodplain areas nearby. Now the best thing about this riverbed is the large trees that we have on the banks because they've got better access to water here. Trees that normally wouldn't be so big further away from the riverbed tend to be a lot taller and a lot bigger. So myself and Gerrit's going to continue and we can hopefully pick up on any signs. Our elephants have been giving us a wonderful display. We've had them looking at us. A big car came and stood about two and a half meters from us. There's one right behind us. Yeah, she's been a little suspicious of our motives here. She did exactly what she's doing there in front of us. Then she went to the side and did the same thing and has now gone around the back. And when an elephant opens her ears out like that, she's indicating, well, I wouldn't say outright distress, but she's certainly indicating that she's a little bit suspicious of what we want here. But the rest of the herd is unconcerned, and I suspect it's because the others are sitting so close to us, some of the youngsters, that she is indicating her displeasure. It may well be at them rather than at us. No, Jasmine, elephants don't sharpen their tusks on purpose. And that's an interesting question because some animals do sharpen their weapons, if you like. We know that rhino sharpen their horns, so you often find smooth bits of straight tree that have been rubbed almost raw. 
by rhinos. Now here's a youngster, and I think actually that this is what the cow is looking at. I think she's watching this one here. Not very happy that the little one was between us all. Now let's watch what happens because there's that cow with her other youngster. Yeah, and as soon as the second one walked past the front, so she's relaxed a bit. So I suspect that they were talking to each other the whole time. They would have made soft infrasonic sounds that sound like that, sort of. And now they've all gathered on the one side of us. So the oldest cow has managed to pull the rest of the herd across to where she is. And that's made her much more comfortable. How interesting. So I don't think it was anything we did at all. I think it was the fact that the herd kind of split and walked around us. And she turned around and suddenly saw that either her older offspring or perhaps uh, niece or nephew was the other side of us and she didn't like that very much and so I think she was talking to him or her until he or she walked around the front of us and joined them on that side. See, it's all very calm, very peaceful. And you know, if you're feeling a little bit rough, upset, sad, miserable, tense, being around elephants can often be the soothing balm that'll make you feel better. They are so calming to be around. Anna-Marie, you say you love baby Ellies? Yes, well, I think anyone who doesn't love a baby Ellie will probably have to have their heads red. They are very, very cute. Their behavior is normally playful and amusing. And apart from being interesting to watch, they are thoroughly funny. And now we are looking at some impala through the long grasses and the trees. They're a little bit nervous. See how they're staring at us? Others have their... In fact, everyone's got their heads up now. Now, this is really important. I like sitting with impalas when we're going to look for a leopard because they can give us those clues. Now, there was a brief alarm call behind us, but because of the weather, as was described to you before, it's windy, it's dull, they can get very nervous. The smells of a predator that can be maybe two or three roads down, can waft over. Now they've relaxed again. But still, still quite alert. I'm sure this leopardess is close by. We heard an alarm call behind us. But when there is a leopard on the move, you'll usually find that all the impala in that herd will alarm, not just one. So one alarm call with this kind of weather is not very reliable. So that's why I'm sitting tight and waiting for any more alarm calls. This is a bachelor herd. You can see they've all got horns. And when the heads of some are down, others are up. Because nobody wants to be breakfast for the leopardess we're looking for. And like I told you earlier on, this lioness is tummy full. And the main reason 
is that carcass. She made a kill during the night. She has eaten quite a lot of it. And that's why she didn't go immediately for that, uh, for the wildebeest when they were close. They are still not very far. So I'm still here because anything can happen. Cats are cats. It's just like a domestic cat. If it has killed a mouse and another one, you know, passes by, it will pounce on it very much like this large African cat. It does the same, only that it is so full and it's not very interested until time is perfect. What would be ideal here would be the will be starting to lie down, then she would go. But I don't know what's going on in her mind. They are not very far at all, and any moment it can happen. Remember, this is life. This is happening now from the Masai Mara. Look at, uh, you know, the wildebeest. They look like they know something is there. Ribbon, you asked me if it's easier for male lions to hunt alone than females. Well, both of them do hunt. They have been perceived not to hunt at all male lions, but I have seen them, you know, hunting many, many times. What happens is after the Arctic kicked out at the age of about three by the main male and the females, they become nomadic and during this time they are, uh, you know, they hunt for themselves. They go for big and slow animals like giraffe, buffalo, hippo. Usually it's better if they are in a collision. So they do hunt. It's not easy. They are also needed, you know, when they're in a pride to help bring down big animals like buffalo because they are much heavier, almost twice the size of females. So it's a myth. It's not true that, you know, lions are just lazy. They do hunt. Yeah, look, this is the beauty of the Masai Mara. You're looking at wildebeest and under the same frame, there's an elephant across the other side. Yeah, so it's amazing, you know, what is around and what you can see. All these arrived last night. Right now, it's getting better and better for us here in the Masai Mara because they're only like um, two miles from camp. But about uh, five days ago, we had to, you know, to drive almost 30 miles to where they were. So they've been moving constantly towards us. I don't know what she's doing. Okay, she's got her head up. I don't know what she's thinking. It still might happen. So I'm still gonna stick around, send your positive vibes, send your good lucks, and hopefully it happens. Our elephants. We're going to do one more little segment with them, I think, and then we'll move on and see if we can find a predator of some description. It's just so nice having them out in the open. Please excuse the power line if you do see it. That's just because we do have to get electricity into the reserve somehow, and that's the best way of doing it. Now, please do talk to us, remember, using the hashtag CGTNWild or the hashtag WildEarth on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, you may come to the cut line. Now, this whole herd is sort of moving towards the north. I think they'll probably graze through these clearings for the next, I don't know, maybe two hours or so before finding some water eventually. And that big cow now crossing the road in front of us is the one that was watching us very carefully before. And I wonder if this herd is not perhaps led by quite a young matriarch a careful young matriarch, but a matriarch that has not put any kind of tension into the rest of the herd. And so although she was watching us very carefully, the rest of the herd has given no indication of stress whatsoever, which means she's not sort of warning them off, if you know what I mean. 
She's just allowing them to go about things and she's being very careful about it. Let me roll slowly forward. As we enjoy them. They've all just sort of started heading up there. We'll wait for this one to move. There's another very big cow crossing into picture now. And I think maybe that one is also part of the leadership group. Carmen, elephants will have a baby once every sort of five years or so. So the gestation period is almost two years, 22 months. And then they will fall pregnant again normally when their next baby is about two years old. So, you know, four to five years or so is the birthing interval. And it's very consistent. So an elephant can produce a baby every five years and not really struggle to do that, which means that their populations do grow relatively fast. Let's drift forward slightly. ones and they're being accompanied by a fork-tailed drongo. Can you see the black bird there Theo? There are a couple of them. You always find birds, starlings or drongos or sometimes even hornbills following along with the herds and that's because they're hoping for insects that might be kicked up or disturbed by the feeding or walking of the elephants. also be able to hear the lovely sound of the swishing trunks and the grass being picked and then they shake the dust off whick, whick, and then eat it. This one is trying to get his full teeth around a greenish sickle bush. Because the sickle bush might be a sour plum. Can't really tell from here. Position, a little bit of action from the lioness. She's got her head up. I don't know what she's thinking. Remember, she is definitely not alone. When times are tough, lions, lionesses, and males, and young ones, sometimes they split within their territory. So whatever they find is enough for themselves. And in this case, this lioness is alone, but it doesn't mean she is not part of a pride. She is part of a pride, but sooner or later, they will actually gather up by vocalizing, which is roaring, and very low roars, uh, which attract one another, which then they will stay together until times are tough, then they will split. The wildebeest have moved further, so chances of her getting them now are slimmer. The reason I say this is they were much closer earlier when I was here in the beginning of the show and she didn't do anything. For right now, she is very much what they call them sometimes, opportunists. Lions have been termed as opportunists because they will wait for a chance to prevail itself, then they will utilize it. And in this case, this is very true of this lone lioness. She is panting, you can tell she's starting to get hot because she, ha she is tummy full and also she Keith, you asked me if this lioness would be able to bring down a wildebeest by herself. Of course, that is a piece of cake for a lioness. 
they are very strong and very fast and uh, wildebeest is a good size for her. I would say the biggest animal that she cannot bring down is a buffalo or a giraffe, but a wildebeest, a zebra, topi, those ones she can bring down with ease. The wildebeest are getting deeper into the bushes where it's actually, actually much more dangerous, but it's like they know there is no danger there. That's why they're very comfortable. Uh, this is the kind of area where they don't hang around very much, but I think uh, the, there is no scent, there is no smell, there is no signs of any predator, so they are very comfortable. It would be nice if she got up so we could see her size and maybe find out who she is. You can tell that she is like checking out, uh, you know, how far have they gone? Are they gonna come back? Okay, I'll let you enjoy this. Her face, her head when she turns around, and then after this I'm gonna look for something else and maybe come back here later on. I am trying to find for you the green wood hoopers that we can hear. these birds so much. I think there's quite a lot of nice birding going on here. So here we have the green wood hoopoo. It loves larvae. So you'd see it along the branches of trees. Knocking at the wood trying to get larvae. In fact, very similar to what a woodpecker does. Oh, I see a wood. Ah, oh. this is the problem with birds, of course, as you would know, is that they can fly, where most other things don't. And before you know it, they're out of your view. I see it. BK, there's a grey headed bush shrike just off to the. <laughs> this is very difficult. On the same tree that the, that the green wood hoopoo was on. Yep, that's the one. Somewhere there. Where have you gotten to? I'm going to try and just roll forward a little bit. If I start up, they'll all just move. And of course, my vehicle doesn't want to roll. We're going to have to start up very gently. Don't go, birds. Don't go. Let's just watch here for a moment. You can still hear them all. Let's just scan this tree. But you can hear a whole lot of them. And now they've all gone. <laughs> I love, love looking for birds. I love finding birds and showing them to you because it's such a challenge. Just making sure there's nothing else around here, at least that we can see. Not. All right, well, the dam is right over on my right. So I'm going to pop there and see what's What's a crackalacking? Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Dumi from 
and beyond being a private game reserve. Uh, Craig right behind the camera. As you can see, lovely, lovely sighting with the uh, two liners with the five cups, which is amazing. Start in the morning. It's a beautiful day. Um, just starting getting mobile now. I'm not sure if they, how far they're going to go. Look at these cups. Running over like that. Yeah, it's quite interesting to see that look, that line is look very quite, quite thin. Oh, look at these cups running towards us, playing just like that. This is the most, most important for them to do because what, what, what is happening like now, as you can see, they're just teaching themselves to run and to defend themselves whenever, whenever, whenever they, whenever they come to the tough, uh, a situation so they can be able to, to to deal with that. That's why that's why they always have to run, have to chase. There's so many techniques they can learn by doing this. Wow. But you you won't be able to hear that. As you can see the cops is lifting lifting the head up listening. There's an order of the mail for miles away. They like wonder. Oh, look at that awesome jumping like that. They caught that one down. But the two mothers they just went. I'm not sure if they're still mobile, but we'll, we'll just watch these cops playing like that because it's amazing to watch them. They look, their bellies are look quite uh, fat, but their mothers, they look quite quite thin as well. Oh, look at that digging. Because they have a big pole. You can see the pile of sand that they keep, they're pushing out from the ground. It's amazing to see their poles, how big they, their poles are, comparing their body size. Look at that, digging. This is, even that, you can think they're just playing, but it's just part of, part of practicing. Because when they, Because when they older, they'll be able to, to be able to dig. Sometime you find them digging warthogs. So we just sit here and wait and see what is gonna end. So while we're busy searching for the lions, we've come across this bird, an amazing bird. And you can see it looks like it's just hovering in one place. There we can see clearly what it is black tips on the wings. This is called a black-winged kite. It's a very pale bird and usually we find them ooh, and it seems like it's going. It was hovering around in this area for quite a while. You can see it's just stopped again. Now this area has got some nice open clearings, grassland, and that's usually the areas where we find them. So while we're looking for lions that move in similar areas which little bit more open looking for large grazing antelope this little bird is looking for any rodents that might be hiding in between the long grass here and then what it does is it have that distinctive hovering um, behavior that it does where it will just stop above an area might have spotted something have a good look and then it will strike down from there How amazing is that? Listen to this. You're looking at a lilac-breasted -like roller there. Its call is not as pretty as it is. That's it going bah, bah, bah. Then we've got the green wood hoopoos at the bottom again. They're making the more squeaky kind of sound. Lots of birds here that I can actually show you, which is great. And then there's a squirrel.
Indy, you'd like to know what makes the feathers look like that. That is an excellent question. And actually, a better example is to look at this virtual starling that's on the ground here, which has the same effect on its feathers. We call this iridescence. And it is a result of structural coloration. So there's no pigment. The only pigment that are in those feathers is melanin. That's what makes them dark and strong. Melanin is a very strong, complex molecule. And this iridescence is caused by tiny little microstructures that are on the feathers that bend and reflect light to produce that sheen that we see. That's why when it's very dull, like it is today, you only get a little bit of that sheen. But when it is very bright, they can look quite amazing, kind of like little jewels. Very, very shiny. And lots of animals actually exhibit iridescence in some form or the other. Oh, there's a Cape Turtle tub in the background there too. And it's an awesome thing. It's one of my favorite things around here especially to see on birds because it is just stunning. Welcome guys. We're just trying to re lo lo locate these lines again. They actually start getting moved. We don't want to lose them because it looks like they might be heading to the bush. As you can see, it's quite bushes here. Here we go. Um, we just find them again. They're slowly moving on along the road, so we're gonna try to get a reposition just now. Um, looks like uh, they must be trying to find something into this kind of bushes. As you can see, it's quite a lot of trees, but they're walking along the road. Problem. Okay. As you can see, guys, they're, they're moving like that. And because they will, looks like they might be hunt overnight. So, but what they can sometimes do, like they can walk around and trying to find a beautiful spot to rest because they're not, they're not, they're not actually quite thin. If you look at the calf's bellies and look at that. Look at Linus on his shoulders like that.
Bonding between the adults and the cubs often shows these cats' cute and cuddly side. Contrary to what popular culture would have you believe, male lions are not part of the pride and live in coalitions. Young males leave their prides in their adolescence, brothers and cousins roaming the wild in search of a territory of their own. In time, the males settle and look to fortify their feline lineage. Although lazy when it comes to finding their own food, males have an endearing bond with their cubs. But conflict is never far off, as stronger youngsters are always on the horizon, lying in wait to take over territory and claim a pride for themselves. It is an awful sight, but pushes the females of the pride into estrus, allowing the incoming males to state their claim and further their own bloodline. The dynamics displayed by these social cats are intriguing and ever-changing, a contradiction of cuteness and feline ferocity. Yes, more and more wildebeest. Just turn the vehicle around so I can share this beautiful view. It's one of a kind. I hope you are enjoying this. Remember, we are in the middle or in the high height of the migration, the wildebeest migration, I mean. Although they're not the only ones that migrate during this time, but they outnumber everybody during this time of the migration. That guy, little guy is calling. Can you hear him? Do you hear him? Yeah, this is all part of the whole experience. Young ones lose their mothers, and this is the time they start learning the tough way how to be a wild beast from a very young age. Definitely, it has lost its mom. Sorry, little guy. You have to tough up now and become a wildebeest. Definitely, he's calling. Can you imagine looking for your mom amongst 500,000 mothers? If you find her, I don't think you would let go again. For this guy, I don't know his fate, but chances of finding her mother are very slim. This happens during crossings. It happens during, you know, hunts when they, they are spooked by lions. Okay, uh, back again and they're facing away from me. We've just been watching somebody who had lost her mom, desperately calling. You could tell in her face that she's really sad to lose her mom. I can imagine, you know, how it feels. Well, these guys are very busy enjoying the grass. No war in the world. This is, you know, what they do best. We sometimes call them lawnmowers of the Mara. That guy walking with an interesting gait or pasture is a male and he's had enough of eating and now he's just walking around smelling around for females who are coming into season. Look at that. Yeah, that is good camera camera man, manship you see how many we have all around you know we don't see one will be twice yeah they're in front of the road crossing from one side to the other 
Yeah, this time of the year, there will be a lot of mating, and especially a day like today, when it warms up, you will see a lot of mating. So we are gonna see that later on. Usually they prefer when it's warm. I'm gonna move further down and show you some different wildebeest. They'll be the same, but believe me, they'll be different, different ones. Well, I am showing you some zebra, but it's going to be a very brief appearance because they are wild dogs. Okay, let us go. Wild dogs are on the southern boundary, which means that we have to Ferrari Safari. Hold on, BK. Hold on, everybody. I'm sorry for a brief zebra sighting, but we can always come back to them, right? Unfortunately, wild dogs will move so quickly that we won't have a chance if we don't go right now. Ooh, bumpy, bumpy, bumpy. Don't worry, guys, the cars are used to doing this. They're used to chasing after wild dogs. Now, the wild dogs are at an area that is gonna be, we're all gonna have a very quick sighting because they're moving from one property into another. And because they are on the main road, we may be able to catch them. But even the most fleeting sighting of a wild dog is good enough for us, don't you think? So this is the southern boundary of Juma. gentlemen this is the very moment we have been waiting for and this is the biggest spectacle of the migration in the Masimara. we are sitting on the riverbank of the Mara river and these are wildebeest that are crossing the river right now i'll be quiet for a couple of seconds for you to hear all the plunging and the splashing of the water as they're coming from one end to the other end This is the most special moment of the migration of the wildebeest in the Masai Mara. Neblock would like to know if the buffaloes do the crossing as well. I would say no, they do not do the crossing as the wildebeest do, but we have seen buffaloes just crossing uh, the river from one side to the other, but they do not cross like the wildebeest do in the hundreds or thousands. Look at that. In the water, we got crocodiles. The other side of the river, we could be having lions laying ambush. It could be anything. If unfortunately any one of them struggles and doesn't make it, then too bad for it because it will come a meal for the crocodiles. 
the river is about 50 to about 100 yards in width and you have to cross very quickly now if you look to the left you'll see some other different species of animals crossing and these are toppies which is quite unusual right there in general we have always seen the wilbur's crossing on the on the on their own but we got a different species of animals there the four of them there are toppies and i think or the five they so they will be crossing and they thought why not we got more of them crossing to the right and ladies and gentlemen remember should you have any questions you're more than welcome to ask hashtag cgtn wild or hashtag world earth on twitter for the kids, should you want to send an email asking the question, sending a comment, you may also do that. Kids questions at worldearth.tv. There's one that is struggling. If you look to the right, you can see just the head and the ears. Not sure whether a croc might have gotten it. And if that's the case, then, well, that could be the end of it. I can just see the, the ears or the head of it. And we could be having a croc maybe holding its leg. I just keep quiet again for some moment for you just to enjoy the noise and the splash of the water. Just reposition there, but tell me a good question. Do will be stick with the families as they do the crossing? Yes, among most habibus or antelopes in the Masimara, they'll always they always got small clusters or small tribes amongst them and they always stick together. Now when it comes to be doing something dangerous like this, they always cross as small clusters or small families. Zebras, not sure the Bungay going to catch them if you look to the left there.
possible. Mwaneo kill bungei Kushoto, kuna kill pale Bosye Welcome back, guys, and more wildebeest, different position, and these guys looks like they are on a mission. They have been walking for the last two minutes. I arrived here, and they have a mission. They are going down to the swamp. That's the direction they are going. I think the swamp is going to be choking with them. The grass there is much softer, there is water, so it's a good place to be during the day. And everybody is headed there. I think they will deplete the grass there and they might even dry up the swamp. I will be catching up with them later on to see what's happening up there. This is typical of migration. We call them wasafiri which mean travelers when they go like this wasafiri is swahili or wahamiaji it means you know the migrators here one start walking and everybody follows it's very quickly that they wear the grass and they form these web-like tracks because they creatures running after the water back. Hello, puppy. We just, we hadn't even arrived at the sighting. And they just came running, bursting out the bushes towards this water back. Awesome, awesome stuff. I just want to wait a little bit before I move to try and figure out what is happening. The pups are around two, so I want to move too fast until we figure out exactly what's going on. Definitely don't want to disturb their hunt. So I think, is this the collared individual? So I think this is the alpha female that is collared. All right, it seems to have calmed down just a little bit. Let us move. Oh, on the move again. So I believe it's seven adults L and 12 pups in this pack, there they go. All right, let's try and position. They're scattered all over the place, so let's try and get the best view. Welcome back. Always exciting to see the painted dogs. I, have seen, I haven't seen them for quite a while. It would be nice to see them in the future. Back to our main character, the wildebeest. 
I was talking about how they form these tracks on the ground after wearing the grass. They look like webs. Uh, yes, I have flown on a balloon and on the plane and seen them. Um, very confusing. You wonder what has made them, but this is how they're made. This is typical of migration. You see that? Beautiful. Thank you, James. See, this is how they move. That is a long line. It's a pity we can't show you behind, but it stretches quite behind us. And that's how they walk. Like they really know where they're going. Yeah, sometimes they start running. Sometimes they walk. And when one decides to stop, everybody stops. But this is typical of the migration time. We do see them doing this quite a lot. They move during the day, especially when they need water. They'll move from where there isn't water, like here, towards water. And this is the case here. That is another calf. Lisa, thank you for your comment. You say it's a beautiful landscape and sighting. For sure it is. It's one of a kind. I'm very happy to be sharing this with you. Remember, this is coming live from the Masai Mara, a beautiful place called the Mara Triangle. Yeah, if you want to talk to us, hashtag CTGN Wild or Wild Earth. Yeah, that is where to talk to us. Mm. I meant hashtag CGTN Wild. Yeah, it's not gonna stop, it's going on. They have decided they won't be walking. Look at that. Keep coming more and more and more. Yeah, it's like uh, they know where they're going. Unbelievable. But, you know, in a while they might stop and turn a different direction. That's why they call wildebeest. Look at that. They have started turning right now. This is why, you know, they're so, con you know, confusing. Yeah, they were coming straight towards us. Now they're turning right. Look at this. Two precious, all the puppies. Are here in the road. Amazing. Cute. All of their little ears popping up. This is so, so exciting. So how about we... Oh, something bothering you. We learn a little bit about them through a bit of a quiz because it's a very special thing to see wild dogs. It's a very special sighting. Look at them picking up their heads for that hippo. And why is it so special? So let's go for true or false first. Wild dogs are endangered. True or false? Use that hashtag Wild Earth or hashtag CGTN Wild. And we can chat about the answer. Now, from what I understand, there are 12 pups in this pack. They all picked up their heads, we'd be able to count. But there are definitely plenty of them. So you see the adults have left them here. 
and they're hunting behind us, pretty much. just a, a little puddle of wild dog pups and I am ecstatic to share it with you. So get your answers ready. <laughs> Are wild dogs endangered? True or false? Hashtag wild earth, hashtag CGTN wild. Is a little primate sitting in a tree enjoying the fruits of the jackalberry tree. So this is the vervet monkey. And this tree, strange tree in many respects, is coming into fruit. And I say it's strange because although it's coming into fruit, you can see that its leaves are starting to yellow. And unusually, it's going to lose those leaves as spring comes. Which is a bit strange. This fellow seems to be on his own, which is very odd. They normally occur in fairly large troops. I've seen one other in the area now. But you would expect the entire tree to be full of little monkeys looking for sweet jackalberry fruits to eat. But this chap is on his own. He might be a dispersal male, so a male monkey who is moving from his natal troop to another troop to live in. Definitely a male, you can see that from his bright blue testicles. Giving rise to his Afrikaans name, which is Blow Arp or Blue Ape. And although biologically incorrect, it's not an ape, it's a monkey. It is very blue around that region. Just amazing to watch them move in a tree. Now the other fascinating thing as we see if he comes out again into the open is the way that he views a human being. You and I both know that that animal is completely safe from a human attack. He's there down on the ground, he's come down. Totally safe from a human attack in a tree. But if a human being were to walk to the base of that tree, the monkey would do his best to get out of the tree. It's just gone up, halfway up that tree. He'd do his best to get out of the tree and away from it. Because he sees the human being as a tree climbing primate predator. And I'm not entirely sure why that should be the case. So although you and I would know that he'd be totally safe in that tree from us, he feels unsafe because he would think that we could get up there and get at him. Now he's eating flowers of knobthorn, which smell delicious. I don't know what they taste like. I suppose we can taste some. No, Neva, I've never heard of any alliances between monkeys and lions. Lions will eat monkeys if they can catch them. And so you'll find monkeys will alarm call if they see lions. They'll be very upset. They do not like to be around lions. Oh, he's loving those fruits. Not fruits, flowers, sorry. I think I should taste one myself. The adults have come back, or the alpha female. Alpha male has come back. She is bloodied. So I wonder if they've managed to actually get something as we moved up to the pups. Hello, puppies. Lovely. Oh, this is very exciting. Now I have.
have a few answers to the quiz that I just gave you. I said, are wild dogs endangered? Natalie, Jay, and Kate say it's true, while there were two others that said it was false. Sorry, Rebecca, I'm just listening to the Game Drive radio. Like I said to you, this sighting is one, sensitive, because there are lots of puppies around, and, uh, and yeah, two. Okay, so we might only have to, we might not be able to spend too much time here. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Rebecca. I think we should just be happy that we managed to see them. Now, the reason I spoke about this in the first, uh, in the first case is Mark and the Hill Brothers. Mark and the Hill Brothers say it is false. Well, the reason I gave you that question is to open up a discussion. Hello. On why it is so special to see them. They are, in fact, endangered. So well done to all of you who knew that. They are very much endangered, and you don't see them very often. We have been spoilt with wild dog sightings here on Juma or in Chitwa, this area that we are allowed to traverse. And sometimes it's hard to believe that they, they're endangered, but they certainly are. There's only about 6,500 adults in the world and maybe only one and a half of those are mature that is that they can reproduce and contribute to to the population and they've been endangered for a long 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 time for the last 29 30 years Randy, you'd like to know if a pack could take on a lion. There are a few things that wild dogs will shy away from, and lions are one of those things. If a, but wild dogs are rootless, make, make no mistake about it, they're absolutely rootless. So if they find an injured lion, a sick lion, a lion that is in a position that, that gives the wild dogs the upper hand, they will attempt to take, to take it. Wild dogs have the advantage of these bodies that are built so athletically. They look like they could just run and run and run and run. They're slim and streamlined and they have magnificent teeth and they have all those things going for them and that's besides the fact that they work in a pack something or at least no other animal besides maybe wolves have developed such a pack mentality and such altruism as wild dogs have and that is the advantage that they have in archer in the bush Another animal that is just as social as wild dogs is, of course, elephants. But we've got two elephant bulls for you this afternoon. Not this afternoon, it's the morning still. But unfortunately, they're not as social as the breeding herds. So these bulls, you can obviously see the first one we looked at was much larger than this young fella. And I reckon that this young bull off to the right looks to the older bull as a bit of a mentor. So they will leave the the herd once they get to a certain age and sort of live a life of solitary and sometimes they join up with other elephant bulls. So I suppose they're still a little bit on the social side. Are they just munching away, not eating anything that we would find delicious? It looks like they're just feeding on some twigs and eating the cambium layer, so that's where all the nutrients are sort of passed through a thin layer in, in these trees. And this one is eating us very, very carefully because of all those thorns. Although they've got very tough skin around their mouths and their tongue is pretty tough too. So I don't think that those little prickles would do too much damage, but best to just eat it carefully. 
But that's also not the, the only animal that we've got around here. We'll hopefully get a view of them at some point. But there are some African buffalo also moving uh, in between the elephants. So it could be quite exciting because elephant bulls are a little bit boisterous and will often chase other animals. Okay, flow fly. I don't think the elephants have a filter inside their trunks. Um, it would be quite nice though, because as you said, it would definitely filter out the dust. But I think they just get so used to it um, and they need to use those trunks to actually suck up water to put it into their mouths. So they don't drink water through their mouths directly. They use their trunk as sort of a, a straw, but not a, a, you know, a straw that you can pull through all the way. They suck up a, a couple of liters of water and then they squirt it back into their mouths. Um, but that's essentially an extension of their nose. So you'll eventually get to the sinus cavities if you went all the way up uh, their, their trunks. So no filter there, I'm afraid. Sometimes you'll see them, they'll almost looks like they sneeze and they'll spray lots of dust outside their trunks. But I think they get used to it over time. You can see that trunk there working very hard trying to find only the best of the sticks to eat. But we're not going to go anywhere. We're going to hang around with these two elephant bulls and the buffalo and see what they get up to. So the trackers have done a very, very good job and they've just found these lions. And we're busy watching at one of the big males marking territory. So you can see he's staring back. He's walked all the way, there's a watering hole back there, and he's walked up to this tree where he's just scratched a little bit. Got his claws into the tree, and in the direction that he's looking, there is the young male at a distance back there. I don't know if you can see him, but he is a little bit further off. Right down there we see him. You can see he looks a little bit out of place. Now I know it doesn't look like he's too concerned, but there's a lot of communicating between the two going on here. He knows he needs to stay back. There's one of the other lionesses. And in the direction that she's looking, there's a herd of wildebeers on their way down this side, but they are still very far off. We can't really see them from where we are. Now we haven't seen this lioness or any of the two males for the past couple of days and we were wondering where they were. I think the reason why this big male closer to us is so... he looks like he's in a peculiar mood this morning. Very concerned. You can see he's still staring back all the way to the tree stopped every now and again to mark territory so i think he's a little bit concerned about the presence of that young male Ooh, we're gonna go straight down what a perfect spot right underneath the tree He might just wait until that female makes her way past here. Candace, that is a very, very good question. It's a bit of a tough one to answer. In a coalition, how long do male lions stay together? It depends on the situation, I think. Um, in this case, if it can, they'll stay together up until one dies, or until both dies. It is an essential part of their life. The more they have, the more successful they'll be. And in this case, this guy has only got one other brother. And they've been doing pretty well in this particular area. They have a massive territory. They have cubs with more than one pride. It's not just the pride that they're with at the moment. I think they've been spending a lot of time with this pride because they've got two young cubs here. 
where the cubs with the other pride is already the age of the older cubs in this pride, and some even older. So I can see that this male is a little bit torn between following the lines that's already moved and the other ones down by the water. And I think we are going to stay here and have a look and see what happens from here. We've got a lovely mixed herd of grazers here, some zebra and some impala. And the zebras, if you look at the one on the right there, are partaking of all parts of the grass plant, which is unusual compared with most other grazers. Most other grazers go for the leaves and will avoid the structural stuff. These particular zebra don't seem to mind too much. Now that's important because it means they're able to take advantage of a food source that others are not taking advantage of, and therefore they can avoid competition. And the way they do that is, or the, the reason they're able to do that, is that they can process a tremendous amount of food through their hindgut fermentation system. I mean, that's not particularly interesting, in, except to say that their digestion is inefficient, but it has no limit on volume. And while the impala you're looking at have got a much more efficient digestive rumination system, they have a limit to how much they can eat. So they have to have a food of a certain quality in order to maintain their condition. Whereas a zebra can just process more and more and more as the food quality decreases. And if you look at the impala, they're not looking bad, they're all looking pretty healthy, but they are starting to get slightly little, slightly sort of, uh, I suppose, thinner than they would have been, say, three months ago, and you can just start to see their hips start to show totally normal this time of the year but they will be using a few reserves because the forage is of a pretty poor quality. Neva, you say, is a nice con combination of colours. It is. It is a nice combination of colours. It's also very interesting when you look at animals like this, you look at the zebra striped black and white like they are and the impala, a pretty obvious red colour. You have to ask yourself why it is that animals are the colours that they are. And which one is more effective and why zebras have got stripes and why impalas are not a grayer, browner color as opposed to this much more clear red. And there are lots of different complicated and some not so complicated theories around the coloration of animals. Yes. Especially, I think, with wild dogs. They have the most beautiful coats, but it is certainly complicated, and there's so many reasons for the way coats are the way they are, and the way they get there. Now, it looks like all of the adults have arrived. There's seven adults in this pack, Pungwe pack. Four, five. Where are the other two? And uh, the little pups went crazy. Absolutely crazy. Look at them. I'm going to be quiet. I want you to listen to them. sound that you'll hear of them communicating with each other. And you'll also hear the squeals when they get a little bit excited. There's so many.
Deputy Chappelle, you'd like to know if they leave the cubs with a nurse or somebody to keep them safe while they go hunting. They do when they're still in the den. They keep den guards and they're stationed at the den while the cubs are still in it. But now you can see that they're out and about. So they wouldn't need a den guard right now. You can see the cubs are traveling. But they wouldn't stray too far from the cubs. Just like they did when we came in, they were hunting. We saw the adults, and then we saw that the cubs were left pretty much alone in a little puddle. Oh, look at that. There's so many. All adults are here, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven pups that I can see. I expect there to be twelve, but we'll have a good count just now. So it's nice to hear that the wild dogs have all the adults and all the pups. And this morning we are lucky enough to have all of the adults of this lion pride here as well. Now, you can see there's a bit of excitement with the weather. I think they've got a lot of energy. Look at that one running straight up this side. Now, they're following a little game trail all the way from the water up to the rest of the pride. And the rest have gone to settle not too far from where we are, so this male is kind of looking out for to make sure. It's almost like he's making sure that the whole pride's moving back up and coming together. You can see he's still got his attention fixed in the direction of that young male. And I think that young lioness behind the young male is the last one of the pride to come up this side. Nose, is this the best time of the year for them to hunt the, for prey? Um, it's difficult to say. I would say yes in this particular area because we can see that their condition is excellent. We know that they have been eating quite a lot lately. Uh, most of the times we found them, they've actually had a, quite a rounded full belly. Even though we didn't see them eat, we can see that they did eat. And it's also a little bit easier for them. They blend in better this year. They know that the pressure is on the watering holes, which means that for them it's easier to determine their prey's movements. And that way come up with means of hunting them a little bit easier. So I think they've had their time around the watering hole at this point, and they've all... see the sun's coming out what beautiful light we have on that lion as it's walking up through the clearing they were interested in the wildebeest coming down for a moment you can see that one's still stopping look at the tail tip moving i think it's just contemplating and maybe just checking out the situation see the ears moving a fixed stare, a little bit of a movement from the head. That means it's more than likely saw one of the animals move a little bit. One of the wildebeest. And because it is a predator, it's always assessing an opportunity. In this case, it might not necessarily even attempt to hunt. It's probably just having a look.
Neva, I agree with you. They are perfectly camouflaged during this time of the year. You can actually see specifically this morning with the long grass here and the color that the grass is at the moment. We can see the stark contrast between the grass and some of the green trees nearby. And the lions blend in perfectly. Now, you can see this one's even full of a bit of mud from the watering hole. Now, that is more than likely a big part of why they evolved to have this coloration is for this time of the year for them to be successful. It's a dry time, it's a difficult time on most animals because of the lack of water. And I think the better they blend in, the easier it will be for them to surprise their prey. Because generally speaking, the lion's not the kind of animal that hide away all day. You can see these animals are right out in the open. They made their presence known, and that's why I don't think they're hunting this morning. I think they are just going to rest somewhere nearby. And when they rest, they'll be out of sight. They don't want to draw straight attention to themselves. I think they're also looking for a little bit of shelter from the wind. And the wind's coming from down in the direction that this male is looking at. Oh, he hasn't even really bothered to look around at all. Every now and again he'll have a glance, but now he knows all of the lions of the rest of the pride, the young ones are all back up. You can see in the direction where he's looking. He looks like the concerned father. I don't think he's so much concerned about the whole pride as just making life difficult for the young male. There's a lot of tension going on here, over a large distance. That must be at least 40, 50 meters away. You can see he's also trying not to pay too much attention. There's a bit of grooming going on, so I'm sure he also wants to get up and move in this direction. And when that happens, it should be interesting to see what the true intentions are of this big male. Now what we found over the last couple of months, they've kind of accepted him to an extent as long as he kept his distance. But now time has come and we suspect that these, the large males might have even tried mating with some of the lionesses whose young ones are a lot older. They're approaching two years of age, the oldest ones. And I mean, it's not unheard of for them to start mating again on an interval like that. In fact, we literally just saw this male mate now. How amazing was that? He just mated with one of the females. It is one of those females I was talking about earlier. In front of the whole pride. And then the loud calls afterwards is just to assert his dominance. Showing everybody that he is one of the dominant males in this area. That was a little bit of an unexpected. Expected development. 
But that's the best thing about having a lot of lions around like this is you don't, you can't know for sure exactly what's happening. Well, if that male lion would be here, I can tell you he would have some party time. Well, we have still been stuck, or rather I've been stuck by the river, the Mara River, that's what I'm talking about. And you can see the huge amounts of wildebeest and zebras that lion would enjoy if it was in the Masai Mara in Kenya. Just as you are wondering whether all the wildebeest have crossed the river yet, I will say to me is only 30% of the wildebeest that might have crossed the river. So we still got more and more still coming. It depends on where they are, what exactly they're doing, and the pace they are going in. So currently, I would say 30% of the total, a million wildebeest or so, have crossed the river. We still have more that will be coming. So we're just sitting very, very close to the river, and and what will happen is to be patient. That's very important when you come to a crossing point. Is one, I would say, a big spectacle where you get other people also entrusted to watch the same. And there's a bit of uh, discipline that has uh, to be followed or some, condo, some uh, kind of code that the game rangers will put in place so that everybody can benefit and enjoy the crossing. Mainly what the game rangers will want to do or what we know as guides we need to do is to give room to the wildebeest. So you may stay quite a distance away from the river, not far, but you can sit, still watch the wildebeest and read their body language, watching their movement. And as soon as they start crossing, that's when you come close to the river. Otherwise, if you come so close to the river, they will not cross and you're going to block their way. So that's the river, that's where we saw a crossing a couple of minutes ago. And we just sit here, wait if others will come, build the numbers, the pressure gets bigger, and the closest one to the river will just go right in. In there, we got hippos, we got crocodiles, and as I said earlier, I am going to stay put here and see what happens maybe in the next moments. Black rhino are well known for their short tempers. While the big cats spend most of their time asleep, their waking hours are often filled with violent conflicts for mates, food and territory. There's no room for chivalry amongst leopards. This grizzled old male thinks nothing of stealing food from a hard-working young leopardess. The stability of a cheetah coalition is often shattered by a fight for dominance. <laughs> A lion's size will always deter its hyena cousins. Confronting the clan can shift the balance. But safety is not always found in numbers. Even a pack of wild dogs can fall prey to a lion. Conflict in the wild rarely ends in a peaceful compromise. Welcome back, and here I have something different from you. After learning about the cuts, we learn a little bit about birds. Here I have Quite a good number of sacred ibis. There's one flying. <laughs> well done, James. Yeah, he was too fast for you. 
Yeah, the black and the ones with the carved beak, that one walking really fast, that is sacred ibis. The one with the yellow beak and black legs is great egret. And uh, there are two species here. You can tell there could be something in the long grass, in the grass there. Could be frogs, could be, you know, worms, earthworms. And that's what they're busy eating. There are so many of them here. Nice. Look at that. Yeah. Beautiful. I wish I could fly. Yes, um, you can tell this is a swampy area. So there could be plenty of worms. Usually they detect that one comes and then another one patches and then everybody comes. And this is the case here. You can tell some of them are very busy preening themselves and some of them are busy probing the ground for the worms. Cattle egrets, great egrets and sacred ibis all mixed up together. So this is going to be it. This is going to be our last segment with these guys. And they are in total 12 puppies. So everyone is accounted for, all adults, all puppies. And it looks like the adults have actually been regurgitating for these little ones and making them into quite a frenzy. Grey beard, you'd like to know how big wild dog packs can get. Generally, they're between, say, 10 and 30 individuals, but there are instances where they have actually gotten bigger than that, but only at certain times. So maybe two packs merge, two related packs or things like that merge, and it creates one big pack. But as for actual individual packs, you're looking at about 10 to 30 dogs. They look like little bats, almost, to me. Can you imagine uh, that the alpha female can have up to, up to 21 pups? Chloe, great question. In fact, leading on to what I was saying, you'd like to know, how do wild dog mummies feed so many puppies there's a great question and here we have 12 pups and they can have a litter of up to 21 pups that is a lot a lot a lot of mouths to feed absolutely but that's why it's so important to be living in packs much like if you think about humans the reason that we can have large families is that we all work together. And that's how they're able to take care of all of those pups. And because of the sheer volume of pups that one female can have, that's kind of one of the theories as to why only the alpha pair breed, because if all females in the pack had to breed, it would be unbelievable. And she has to produce enough milk to actually wean them, but only at the age of five weeks. With other, other predators, it's much longer. When you think of a hyena, a year and a half. So they do what they can to make sure that all their puppies survive. Anyway, this, like I said, is our last segment. So let's say goodbye to the wild dogs. And hopefully I'll go find you something else interesting in the bush. Here we've got a herd of elephants and they are moving towards a waterhole, which is quite fun. Let me just go a bit forward. I think they're probably going to take about 10 minutes or so to get there. Maybe five. And it's not the same one we started with. This is a different herd. Just as relaxed as the first lot. But they've obviously had their breakfast and now it's been decided 
by the leaders that they must go and have a drink. And although it looks like they're walking very slowly, it is quite amazing to me always how much distance they're able to cover despite their ambling gait. Oh, Sonny, that's a nice question. The benefits of being the matriarch in a herd? There aren't any, really. It's very unlike being the matriarch in a hyena clan. The matriarch in an elephant herd is a leadership position, <coughs> excuse me, a leadership position which has with it a lot of responsibility. It's her job to teach the youngsters where to find food, where to find water. It's her job to coordinate the defensive effort if the th herd is under threat and that sort of thing. So she doesn't actually get any more food. It's not like she mates anymore and has more babies. She doesn't get anything for it save for hopefully keeping her offspring and related and relatives safe and in good health. So I suppose that is some kind of an advantage. Whereas in the matriarchy of a hyena clan, the matriarch is like a mafia don. She gets to eat more. She's the one who will dominate carcasses. Her cubs will dominate at the den and eat a bit more than anyone else does. And so there, there really is an advantage, an individual advantage to being the matriarch. But with elephants, it's a much more leadership role. Much more leadership orientated role. It's crucial to the survival of the herd. It's also not established with aggression. So the matriarchy is established through, I suppose, just time, really, where the oldest female is normally the matriarch of the herd, whereas in a hyena clan the matriarchy can change, and that change normally happens with death or violence, or both, often both. So the herd's going to kind of walk along this game path, maybe feeding a bit, and then eventually they will arrive at the water. James, we beat you to it this morning because we already have one elephant at uh, Nlovu Dam and I suspect that there will be more elephants that come down, but we'll have to be a little bit patient. The clouds are finally burning away and the sun is coming out, so once it warms up, I think more animals will head on here. But just a young bull all by himself and actually not sticking around for too long, literally just a very, very quick drink. And now I think he'll go off and find something delicious to feed on for the rest of the day. I'm sure that they, well, this elephant in particular, will be back maybe this afternoon to have a bit of a, a splash in the water. But we're just about to lose him. But just down and below, there's a heron. Can you see the heron, Sebastian? Just to the right, there it is. It's got its long neck. It looks like it's growing from out of the ground. But it too has been frozen this morning. Not quite wanting to wake up just yet. And it'd be nice to see it also walking around in the water and trying to catch some fish because I'm sure that there are lots in here. But <laughs> more and more animals keep coming on down. The next one to arrive at Ndlovu Dam is the most common antelope species in Africa, the impala. There you go, you can see them all, some of them more excited than others. So those ones with the big horns, those are the males, 
and the ones with Antony horns, those are the females. So at this time of the year, you will see both sexes quite happily mingling with one another because they're rutting season. So when the males fight for breeding rights with herds of, uh, of the impala females, that's over. So they're all a little bit more relaxed. Oh, hello. Casey's come back. The elephant. <laughs> He's gone. No, I'm not finished just yet. Sure, there's a lot of impala coming on through. Just doing a quick walkabout. Or are you going to come over to us and say hello? Young elephant bulls can be quite inquisitive. You can see that trunk is investigating on the ground quite heavily. There were some elephants that were swimming here last night, so I'm not sure if it was a breeding herd. Maybe he's picking up on the scent of some other elephants. It looks like he's struggling to walk. And so what happens is that in rainy season, this entire area is covered in water. The dam is a lot more full. But you can see it hasn't quite dried up enough there. So the, the surface looks hard, but for the weight of an elephant, you can see he's sliding in and falling into the mud just a little bit. That looks very uncomfortable. <laughs> But elephants are just fantastic animals. Take a look at what else you can find out about them. Elephants have fascinated us for so long because they display the same social complexities and full emotional range of our own human species. Mothers, sisters, cousins and aunts live in herds while the bulls wander the wilderness as bachelors. Cows live in the same herd from birth until the end of their life, some 60 years later. The herd is led by the oldest and wisest female, the matriarch. She's not only responsible for leading the herd, but also dishing out discipline to the often unruly teenagers. With their flappy ears, floppy trunks, and folded skin, baby elephants have the cuteness edge over their human counterparts. Like toddlers, they are playful, curious, and love rolling about in the dirt. Human voices and vehicles provide endless entertainment for bored little elephants, and they, in turn, are always a source of amusement for us. the main source of calf entertainment, but it's a scary and sometimes prickly world out there. And mum is thankfully never far off. Bulls become boisterous when they hit puberty, and this irritates the matriarch. Once she's had enough, she will boot them out of the herd to find their own way in the world. Like playground bullies, the young males fight for dominance, sometimes with extreme violence. The older bulls live alone but mentor these young bucks. It is these fellows that are the ultimate gentlemen of the wilderness. You've learnt a bit more about the social structure of elephants and here is a herd moving towards the water and you can see that they're a society that is, I suppose, really quite akin to our own in so much as there is a group of elders that have to teach the youngsters what to do and that's exactly what's going on here. With the whole herd moving towards a waterhole, they'll be led by the matriarch and slowly the youngsters will learn which paths are the best 
and which paths contain the greatest amount of food and at which times of the year. And that is a process that takes time, much as it does with human beings and their learning. Let me carry on, I think. Let's just move here, because what I want to do is be at the water when they arrive. And this path comes across onto the road. So let's just get past them. And we'll go and sit here at the water. And then I think they'll arrive shortly. the Masai Mara. Remember this is live straight from the Masai Mara. Look what I just found, a young male from the River Pride. I saw one other female quite a distance away. We'll be sharing that with you later. And while I was trying to get close to her, I came across this young guy, probably about two and a half years, another maybe half year to a year and then he'll be chased out which is very typical of young males when they reach that age they become too dominant they eat as much as adult females they become competitors to the females and the prevailing males so the only solution is for the male and the females gang up to chase them away where they become nomadic males for a period of about three to four years. During this time, they hunt for themselves, uh, uh, you know, to accumulate lots of fat. They become big. At the age of about five, they're big enough to intimidate, uh, you know, big males. They advertise themselves by urinating and passing their scents into bushes and trees. Usually, it tells a lot. And then if they find a male that is weak or that is not weak, they will challenge him. Usually they are much more successful if they are more than one. He's got a kill that is to the left of the bush. I would assume there are more because there is a lot of hiding places around this area. There are very many in the River Pride. I don't know how many there are here, but he's the only one I have seen. Uh, this close to me. Wildebeest are all over. You can see them at you know behind him. And as you know, this is time of plenty. Look at that. They are not very far. So it's a matter of digesting as fast as possible, and then going back for another one. Looks like uh, that. Those guys there can see something. I don't know what they see. The wildebeest. They have good eyesight, but they tend to forget very quickly. Remember, this is coming live from the Masai Mara. If you want to talk to us, engage us, talk to us on Twitter, hashtag CGTN Wild, or hashtag Wild Earth. Questions, comments are very, very welcome. He is very, very beautiful. No scars, no cuts, very clean. But I bet you, in another couple of years, that face is gonna have character. You know, it's gonna have scratches, bites, because getting to the top is not easy for young males. I'll stick around here, maybe change positions, and wait for you to come back. And there, you can see the male's got his head up, the one on the left. And that's the other male, not the one we saw earlier trying to act all tough around the young male. Now this guy, he's got quite a temper on him. And he's got good reason to. If you see the other one in the picture, on his feet we can only see, that's the female he's been mating with. Now we've seen him mate three times with her already this morning, which is followed by a huge roar and some profuse territorial marking you can see even though this little bit of sunlight coming through is making his eyes 
clothes from time to time and he really wants to take a nap, he's still alert. And this is usually what we see in between every time that they mate. Is they'll lay down like this, they won't really do too much or move around too much. The male will lay close to the female, kind of keeping guard over her in a way. We saw he was even acting a little bit aggressive towards his brother. You can see there the female's flat down. She doesn't have a care in the world at the moment. Now every couple of minutes, sometimes up to 15 minutes or even longer, they might mate. And when that happens, it's usually very short. Only a few seconds and then it's over. But the noises, usually, especially in a case like this where the whole pride is present, will make them all react, at least put their heads up. Sometimes some of them might even call a little bit. Look at what we've got. So we, you're still with us. We've well, just come back to us here at Pridelands at the, the Eco Training Camp. And all of a sudden, the Impala just ran in about 20 different directions. And you can hear them. They're snorting in the distance because this lioness tried to sneak up on them. Can you hear those sort of snorting sounds? Oh, the Impala. We're very lucky to get out of there because she looks like she is hungry and she wants something to eat. Now, you might remember at the beginning of the show, I did mention that we heard some lions contact calling, but we couldn't find them. We didn't even see a track. Now, I'm wondering if it was this lioness and if there are maybe other lions. I'm just going to reposition very quickly. It just requires me to just reverse a little bit. So apologies for that. Let me do that, and then we will get another view of her because she's just sat up on the damn wall now. No, no. Why is she running like that? She's just run over the top of the damn wall. The Impala also r have run in the other direction. Is she on the other side? Yeah, she, where she was, so to the left, far left, yeah, um, in that gap over there. So she's just got up and moved. The birds are going crazy. I don't know if there is something else around here too. We did have some fresh leopard tracks coming in this direction. Not that a lioness would be frightened of a leopard. Hmm. Interesting. But unfortunately, we cannot get around to the other side from here. We have to do quite a big detour to get to her. And I don't know what direction she's moving in right now. But it's quite exciting because the impala is still around and there are also some zebra making their way down to the dam. The elephants have arrived at the water and they're now having a very replenishing drink. It's not a hot day by any stretch of the imagination, quite chilly still, but they need a lot of water to process the winter vegetation that they must eat in such huge volume. Eat, drink, walk. This is the lesson that the youngsters have to learn. But it's a bit more complicated than that, as we were discussing. They need to learn what to eat when, where the best spots to eat are, and of course where all the water is. <clears throat> Excuse me. So some of them have headed off across to the other side of the waterhole, and others were a bit braver and decided to come and drink right where we were. It's not hugely enthusiastic drinking. You know, normally on a hot day, you'll see them rushing down 
Some of them will spray water all over themselves. Some of them will go for a swim. Sometimes on a day like this, you'll find them swimming, but normally not. Doesn't look to me like swimming is in the offing today. the other side. You can see how slowly they're ambling. Honey, Ruda, for sure elephants have a role in the ecosystem. I'm just going to shift forward a bit. They have a keystone role in the ecosystem. They are to a large extent, the greatest architects of this landscape. Without them, this landscape would look profoundly different. So for example, in the Kruger National Park area, there are about 15,000 elephants at last count, and all of them eating an enormous amount of food every day. And so they change the structure of the vegetation profoundly. And the changes that they wreak are effective on so many levels for so many other species. Just if we look, in fact, to the side here, we can see a tree that was pushed over by an elephant. And this particular tree did actually rot from the inside before it was pushed over. But the pushing over of this tree has created a whole new ecosystem. Without the elephants, that ecosystem would not have been created. And so, yes, elephants have a massive role in the ecosystem. But I think it's important to understand that the ecosystem itself doesn't provide a niche or a role for the elephants to fulfill. What's happened is that over the course of evolutionary time, the elephants and the ecosystem in which they exist have evolved together, such that the ecosystem that is around them is able to survive with the elephants in it, and the elephants are able to best survive in the ecosystem in which they find themselves. And that's a, a constantly changing thing. So if you were to come back to the Earth, say, in about, I don't know, 200 to 300,000 years, you'd probably find that it would look very different. These elephants would have got have various adaptations. The ecosystem would have changed, the vegetation would have changed, and things would have moved along. And so while they do play a role in the ecosystem, the correct way to look at it is much more that they occupy a niche. They don't fulfill a function. They occupy a niche that has a certain effect on the ecosystem around them and the ecosystem and the as various aspects of that ecosystem adapt according to interactions with elephants and also the myriad other species that occur in the area. But we do call elephants a keystone species because their effect is so profound in whatever environment they are. Well, talking about the elephants and being key in the environment, I would say they will be do the same uh, here in the Masai Mara. Because what would happen, you would imagine the number of thousands and thousands of the wildebeest moving on the ground. What happens is as they walk, they keep eating the grass, they churn the soil, and you would imagine they tend to turn it around, which would help the vegetation to get better. So as much as you would say elephants are so key, to changing the vegetation and balancing the ecosystem, they will be to do the same. Now, have a look. We've got a, quite a huge herd of them walking there. So you'd imagine each beast with four legs, look at the size of the hooves, what they step on, they churn that piece of land, turn it around, 
And just like in our villages or in our homes, how we go, we go digging in our gardens, I would say the wildebeest tend to do the same. And then of course, once it rains, plus all the droppings they leave behind, like fertilizer or like natural manure, the vegetation or the small little uh, grass or plant that would grow, it makes it easy for them to do that. Now, the herd you see there is heading towards the river. We saw a crossing earlier, and we're just crossing fingers that we'll see uh, another crossing. There's a very high potential that they will cross. So I'm staying here, no rush. Patience, it's very important by the riverbank, and we'll see what will happen. Patience is so, so important in the bush. It's what lets us get the sightings that are so incredible. Here we have some zebra going about their daily business that herbivores do, which is like James said to you with the elephants, eat, drink, ablutions, obviously, and the occasional deep sleep. Now we're chatting about how animals change their landscape. And zebras also have an influence on the landscape. All animals do. As they walk around and they trample grass, leaves areas open for other seeds to come in and germinate. And they walk through it in their little herd. So actually a lot more stomping goes on than you may expect. Not as much as you would see with an elephant, but definitely they also affect the landscape in that way. Now they're often seen foraging with wildebeest. And wildebeest just chomp and chomp on the grass. And then the zebra like the smaller grasses or the lower grasses. So it's like a lawn mowing system. The wildebeest come in indiscriminately eat, then the zebra come in, they clip the, the grass even shorter and it keeps them, it keeps the grasses at bay because what will happen is that grasses are fuel for fires, especially at this time of year when it's very dry. It's about the driest point and now it's windy as well. So it's important for the herbivores to move around and eat as much of that as they can. So there isn't fuel for fires. Also, if there's too much dead grass on top of itself. It can kill itself or suffocate itself. We call that dead grass heaps moribund. And all these herbivores help in keeping all of that in check and making sure that fires don't have too much fuel. Of course, they're not thinking about that kind of thing, but because of the way the system works, everybody has a job from the ants, termites, spiders, all the way up to elephants and our predators. Everyone has a job in shaping this landscape. You can see that tail is swishing back and forth, making sure that no parasites no flies are getting into the sensitive bits. And they will also occasionally eat quite dry, even burnt twigs and grass, which again is important in controlling 
fail to fires. You see some Impala coming to join them now. There was a massive herd with them at first. Now there's two young boys that are coming along too. And you'll, like we said before, herbivores working together all after the same type of thing, but just a little bit different. These boys are mixed feeders, so they're not just grazers. They'll be looking for leaves as well as bits of grass. And I'm still with my wildebeest a little bit further up from where I was. Interesting topic you were talking about, you know, animals that contribute to changing landscape. And for sure, wildebeest is one of them. The zebra and wildebeest, um, elephant, all of them, they do help. Over here, you can see this animal, the wildebeest, doing exactly that. It is important to get rid of this grass and also to fertilize it. And this is what, uh, the, what is the role of the wildebeest. Smaller antelopes like Grant's gazelle, waterbuck, Thompson's reedbuck, oribi, um, uh, dicus, dictics, all of them cannot exist in such a long grass and so the wildebeest play a big role in making sure that they mow it down. This is a duty they have dedicated themselves to doing for the last about 70 years since the you know migration started and they come every year to do that exactly passing through same spots for about three months making sure it's all the way down before leaving back to the Serengeti. This is an animal that does very well. Every year, about half a million are born. Um, Linda, thank you for your question. Um, you ask, you know, how many do wildebeest cross? How many times do they cross the river? I, uh, well, I don't know how to put that, to frame that, but they do cross many times. Um, per day, estimate maybe seven crossings in the high time, which is now. We have very many crossings stretching at an area of about uh, 40 kilometers. So they're crossing at different points. Telling exactly how many times one crosses is hard, I wouldn't lie to you. But per day we can get three to five crossings on a good day up to seven. So um, I hope you know you can you figure out how to um, answer yourself from that because exactly we cannot figure out how many times one crosses but we do get many crossings you know in high time like now yeah that is the beautiful landscape of the beautiful Masai Mara the never um, you know disappointing Ololo Syria escapement back there alone zebra Butchers. Yeah, this time of day, this is typical. When they get hot, they will stop. Sometimes they will be joined by more. It's like they are discussing a strategy of exactly what to do. Usually, they need to drink, so they think of where to go. But some, you know, for some reason, they tend to stop and just look like they're thinking of nothing. Sassy Kathy, thank you for your question. You ask if there are m more wildebeest in the world than any other animal. I doubt. Um, I think in America they have the um, the deer called the longhorn. Um, I don't know if I can, I am correct, but there are very many. 
um, in Africa, these guys are the most. I think, you know, there's somewhere in the world where there's more animals than this. Um, I don't think they're the only ones that outnumber, you know, all the other animals. Yes, uh, but over here, definitely they are, you know, they outnumber all the other animals. Yeah, that is a male. You can tell by, you know, his thick horns, he's got a belly button. And that behavior of, you know, uh, like swinging the head from one side to the other, typical of males, checking out, you know, females in estrus. And that call, they're always calling, ah, 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 ah. That is very typical of wildebeest, you know, call when, you know, especially a male is looking for females. Everyone, we are very lucky because we managed to get another view of the wild dogs that Trishala had a little bit earlier on. They very kindly allowed us back into the sighting. Now, they're heading onto a reserve where we cannot travel, unfortunately, but it's very nice to see them regardless. But I do think it looks like they're adopting a kind of hunting posture. And I know that our boundary is actually not far off towards the left-hand side of your picture. So we might be able to stay with them for longer than you think, or than I had expected. So very special. Oh, they're so lovely. Look at the tiny little thing. Randy, uh, no, as far as I'm aware, wild dogs are very poor pets. They go wild very quickly. So apparently they will raise relatively tamely from babies, but then they start to wander and they start to move around a lot. And you can't keep them domestically and so you can't train them. Okay, they're after something. They're chasing something now. Let's move around a bit here because our boundary is here. And as we came in, we saw a herd of impala. And I'm pretty sure that that's what they're after. Yeah, the impala now running, charging down here. There comes an impala. haven't come out yet. Two impala crossing the road in front of us, running for their lives. They don't bother to alarm call when the dogs are chasing, they just run. Now of course they can change direction 150 times during the course of a chase. So they were running straight towards this area here. The herd of impala was right here. Two of them have scattered that way. The rest have scattered somewhere else. You got, you got them. Uh, and there's some impalas still here. Let's wait here with them. Just keep an eye out, all sides. Let's keep quiet. These guys don't know what's going on here. They don't realize. Let's wait quietly. The wind is blowing, so it's very good hunting conditions. Nothing coming out yet. Now that's strange. I think they must have chased up towards the north. Let's carry on up here. They definitely chased something. You always got to keep a lookout behind. They could pop out anywhere, literally. listening to the radio to see that nobody else has seen them. Let's 
see anything else. I think they're probably chased up towards the north around here, but we'll keep having a look to see if they pitch up. Yeah, they're just watching. Those are vultures, and it's because it's got hot. So while James is looking for those wild dogs, ooh, there's one of the small cubs. That's quite a surprise. In fact, that's about the most excitement we've had in the last few minutes. You can see it's moving into the shade. It's been sun starting to become warmer now. And where this little one was laying, decided to move over. Tammy, I don't think I got your question clearly, but I think it might have been how old they are. Oh, oh, Sorry, so how big is this pride at the moment? And all together here today, we have 18 of them. Two males, which I suppose technically is not quite part of the pride, although they're the fathers of these little ones. And then those two little ones, they're the newest addition. And then there are six other adults and eight young ones. Let's get straight here. We've got a hunt on everyone, their dogs have scattered that herd of impala, they've run all over the place, one of them's gone in there, thousands have gone down here, here's one right here, let's wait with this one and see what happens. He's now listening to hear the rest of the pack. Absolute mayhem going on here. And his ears are the most important part. Here comes another dog behind us. Let's just stay with this one, Theo. I'll tell you if we need to move. I can see another one coming behind us. Yeah, I'm just running up the road behind us. He's gonna follow. All right, let's go. Oh, and here comes another lot, straight in front of, straight from the right. There you go. <laughs> and yet again, the theory that these guys hunt in some kind of coordinated manner is put completely to rest. They do not. They completely bombshell all over the place. See, he's listening now. He's listening to see if he can hear any of the others catching, because they'll make that loud twittering sound to attract the rest of the pack. Here come the puppies. Out of the bush there, they're also waiting, hoping desperately for something to eat. It's important that we're relatively quiet because they use their ears so much. See, they're trying to regroup now. They flushed that whole herd, and I don't, I don't think they hit one. I think if they'd hit one, they all would be running towards where it had been caught now. <laughs> he's hoping, he's looking down to where the others went chasing the last straggler from the herd of Impala. But I think he's going to be disappointed. 
The good news is they're crossing onto Juma, where we're allowed to drive. You might just be able to hear them whining at each other as well. for them to hear also with the amount of wind that there is today. Okay, let's move a little bit. As the pups come out. Here comes another adult. That's the one that I call the toothless wonder. Except he's not toothless at all. He's just missing a piece of his lip, which means that his tooth sticks out. Yeah, they missed there. They're regrouping. Here comes another one, straight out the front. He looks a bit more excited. You can imagine them talking to each other. Did you catch? Did you catch? No, no. Did you? No, no. What about Fido? Did Fido catch? No, no. OK, we'll try again later. Kids are hungry. Yeah, I know. There's Toothy. Sorry, Toothy is a she, I forgot. In fact, I think Toothy is the... might actually be the alpha female. You can see she's been lactating. The rest of the adults slowly starting to move into position now. All right, let's move very slightly forward because we've got the puppies all in a little shady group. stay here for as long as we can. <laughs> Righty, you're still with us? And the puppies are all running up towards where the adults are going to I suppose reaffirm the social bonds and there'll be a big pile of dogs. Yeah, the little ones are now getting a bit of discipline. Mist, is that right, Theo? There we go. And the adults are still moving, and that's obviously because they feel a meal needs to be provided at some stage today, which it does. The smell is just amazing. Neither if they don't have the best sense of hearing in the bush, then they must be, it must be very close to the best sense of hearing in the bush. I don't know if it is the best of the best. It's, again, one of those things that's very difficult to test, but I suspect it must be close. Now, the adults are still trying to hunt. They're still thinking about hunting. So with any luck, they'll have some luck, and we'll be here to see it. So if the wildlife are still thinking about hunting, maybe they should have come over towards this side. You can see we're just having the tail end of, which was a very, very large herd of impala, moving up along a clear game path over that edge there, down towards the feeding grounds where they'll probably spend most of their day.
and only come back later today. Now while this was happening down at the watering hole, the, the lions on the other side, nothing has changed on their side. You can see that the two mating lions are still flat down. We had that young cub move earlier. Ooh, there we go, female head up, scratching a bit. See the male's ear twitched, he definitely is very, very aware of her movements. So let's see what happens here. And see she's looking over towards where the pride is. People often put the time to how often these cats mate. But I have to say, from what I've seen, is it happens in the mornings and when the weather's cooler, they do have more of a regular intervals between mating sessions. But once it gets hot, and usually from about this time of the morning, then the intervals might become a lot longer. So let's have a look and see what she does. She's moving over towards him. Head down. He's up. Oh, oh, look at her throwing herself at him. incredible was that you see look at him scraping his back feet and looking around scraping right on top of that it looks like a magic worry bush <laughs> in fact he might even decide <laughs> just to take it out completely in a bit of an awkward position but I guess what better way to show others that you were here and completely removing it. It's not always just the elephants that break trees and bushes out here. And he's probably gonna go lay back down somewhere close by. You saw the whole pride was roaring when he did his call. And it sounded like one of the older females had a very, very loud response. Well, the young ones often are slightly confusing and they go and move around during this time but look at that lioness see foot up in the air having some wind come through and that's a comfortable position for her at this point we saw the male jumping back right after the white right after they made it and that's because those feet and the front paws coming around quickly can be quite dangerous. Now he's still got his head up and I think he's going to look around for a little bit. But then he'll put his head down as well and things will be relaxed once again for at least the next couple of minutes. Wonderful to see, you know, all that uh, drama or action with the lions there. Well, we do not have to look for animals in the grass because this wildebeest here have eaten, have churned, have stepped on and rolled on this grass, and it is quite short. So we are still stuck by the Mara River, and what these wildebeest have been trying to do is to go down to the water 
and thinking, are we going to cross or not? What are the chances of us getting, being caught by the crocs? So sometimes they go all the way down, have a drink and then come right back. Occasionally I've seen them go down and decide to cross and they go poop to the other side. So we're just waiting patiently to see what would happen. But there's a potential, I still want to believe, of them crossing now. A croc like that that you see there could be a concern. There's one moving to the left of your screen. You see that one there? And I do not know. Oh, it's going to catch a little baby. Oh no, look, look at that. I'll be quiet for some time. Bang. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who could be a bit squeamish, this is all what happens out here in the African bush. And the crocs are carnivores, they need to survive. And that baby wildebeest is gone. Well, rather sad, but what that croc now will do is try and drown the baby and once the baby or the calf gets drowned it will die and gonna stash it somewhere for a meal we'll wait to see if this calf and the coda will pop up any time now we'll just be watching oh it's a cycle of life somebody has to die for the rest to survive sorry about that but look what i have here gray crested crane that is a sub-adult. It is nice to see them when they're growing. He's not fully fledged, so the colors are not bright. They are not uh, as they're supposed to. And he's learning to be a great crested crane. You know, picking little insects, creepy crawlies. And to the left is the mother or the dad. Usually they go together. Excuse me, I'm going to move uh, slightly because um, I was in the middle of the road. Yes, this is called the Great Crested Crane. They pair for life and they have their youngsters and they rear them, bring them up together. We're going to be enjoying them, you know, just in a minute. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. As you can see, um, they are very busy foraging feeding you know on little um, insects locusts um, grasshoppers they are learning that you can tell, tell that there are two that are very scruffy those are the youngsters yeah and the rest are adults the one to the left is an adult and i think the one in the middle there scruffy one is the youngster and then the other one is an adult the third one yeah this bird is found in East Africa. It's a national bird of Uganda. And during mating, males have got this elaborate dance where they jump up and down, up and down. Just he know he's practicing, the little guy. I think he's a male. They jump up and down, jump up, up and down, and then all of a sudden they spread their wings and do a 360. Usually that is very impressive and the female usually gives in mating takes place and typical of them they lay three to two eggs and most of two survive like you can do here they are trying to get away as far as possible from us because we are already a danger we are humans i'm gonna leave them to do their thing Yeah, um, this one, as I said, they're getting away from us. It is the national bird of Uganda. Do you know the national bird of Kenya or the national, uh, the national animal of Kenya? I'll wait for you to give me an answer a short while.
things are really, really interesting in the Mara. The Mara is just amazing in all that it has to offer, especially at a crossing. I've been to the hyena den to see if there was anything happening there. It was very quiet, no adults around. Obviously, the cubs are in the den. But that is it. So now I'm moving west. I might pay a visit to Simbambili and see what that side of the world has to offer. We followed them. The adults got up and ran. We stayed with the youngsters and we followed very gently behind. And it was amazing to watch the little things navigate, stopping, listening, moving, stopping, listening, and running. They obviously knew that something had been killed, and now here they've arrived with the rest of the adults. I can't tell what has died. It looks like a bushbuck to me. Or a nyala. Yeah, it's an... Hmm? Might even be an impala. Can't tell. We'll wait for its head to emerge. It's an impala. Now that thing has been devoured in less than five minutes. Unbelievable scenes here. <laughs> I know it's very macabre. Let me just move up onto this little island here, Fia. I think it might be a little bit more helpful to you. That is a seriously macabre scene there of the alpha male fighting over the head of whatever it is. Yeah, an impala. see them as a, you know, generally egalitarian society. Where here, there's a much more leonine fight going on over the food. Well, that's not particularly aggressive. <laughs> Somebody saw something. The alpha's gone off with the head. He's taken the spoils. The pups are all now begging from the adults who have eaten, and they're fighting over the scraps of what's left. Oh, we got very lucky today. For them to have killed at this time of the day is very unusual. Here comes a hyena. Hyena's coming, belting him. They've caught the hyena. Just wait here. It's a young hyena too. And it's making much more noise than is necessary. Tawny eagle flowing in as well. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Now that hyena is making that noise to discourage being attacked. It's not because it's in a lot of pain. It could easily have just turned around and run away, but it came back towards where it thought there was some food. Completely fearless. And pre also prepared to take a hit. You know, it's prepared to get thumped in order to get some food. Yeah, it's still, the hyena's still around. It has given up now, I think. It's gone off towards the right. But it was prepared to take a couple of bites to investigate to see what it could find. <laughs> and as it all happened, a tawny eagle came floating in, and now Theo spotted a whole lot of vultures, which are also quite keen to get in on the action. But there's going to be absolutely nothing left by the time they get down here.
Yeah, Jenna, it is absolutely crazy. It's completely wild. They are always the most exciting sightings, wild dog sightings. And it just goes to show you never can tell what time of the day it's all going to kick off. This particular action kicked off much later than you'd normally expect. All right, let's move around this little gully, I think, Theo. We'll get a better look at what's going on. I just need to <laughs> fetch Theo's cushion, which <laughs> he dropped out of the car in the excitement of the hyena's arrival. Here's the hyena. That hyena is not scared. So we'll reposition and see what we can find. Or let's wait and see what he does. And that's a young hyena too. I mean, that hyena can't be more than a year old. Some of our viewers will be able to identify it. And asking for more trouble. Here comes an adult now. It's toothy. If toothy gets a sight of this hyena. Ooh, here we go. Hyena missed out. Here it comes. Oof, it's going to be in trouble if the adults see it. Here they come. One bite on the backside, then the dog knew that it was on its own. And if there's one thing a wild dog knows, it's to stay away from the business end of a hyena because those jaws are lethal. And here it comes again. Hyena now coming out of that thicket. I think the rest of the adults have realized, adult dogs I mean, have realized that this is a young hyena and doesn't pose an enormous threat. All right, now we are going to move. We're gonna go around the other side and hopefully get, oh no, hang on. <laughs> Here we go. Unbelievable stuff. Let's just see what happens here. Oh, he's got a little scrap. Well done. Well done, Mr. Hyena. No one's backing you in this particular fight. But you've got yourself a little bit of a meal there. That shows you the value of persistence. Clearly not enough, though. Wants some more. Hyena. If they got hold of it properly, they'd kill it. Giraffe room when it's both. It's both fearlessness and bravery. I mean, without this kind of bravery, uh, hyenas wouldn't eat. Now 
they've left a great big lot. I suppose now what the hyenas got is bits and pieces that wouldn't necessarily be digestible to the dog, so the skin and the bigger bones. Oh, it's going to be very happy with that return. Everyone's had a piece. <laughs> wow. All right, now we really definitely are going to move around and get a better view of the others. Well, that's special. Uh, welcome back guys and now I have something else yeah Africa tallest of the Maasai giraffe and here looks like they're very relaxed these are males I will be telling you that shortly, but we have more of them, and um, they lo all look like they are chewing their cud. Very inquisitive, as you can tell. I love that stare. They look at me like I owe them something. It's like, you know, they know I'm talking about them. Look at them. It is interesting when they chew like that. If you watch, keenly you'll see them swallow and then you'll see them regurgitate uh, you know another cud coming up the neck let's wait and see let's hold there and see he's chewing i'm gonna tell you when to look um he's chewing 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 yum 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 it's very tasty thank you for that side profile okay swallow going down you do you see that okay wait on the neck wait on the neck you'll see a ball come up wait wait you'll see it come up on the neck look at the neck you'll see it come up there it comes yeah i don't know if anybody noticed that but usually it comes like a bullet you see this ball you know coming up and it stretches a little bit and then it chews it and it till it's properly utilized and chewed then it takes it down it is a ruminant, which means it's got a four-chambered stomach. Normally, they'll collect everything they're eating, especially leaves, and put them into the large intestine, the rumen, and then where, where that's where it ferments. It, it gets fermented. It is hard to digest cellulose, so that's where it gets fermented to dilute that cellulose. Then they regurgitate it back, ready to be chewed and taken to the other chambers of the stomachs. This is the famous uh, Maasai giraffe, very widespread and found in East Africa. How you can identify it is by looking at the pattern. It's got a jigsaw puzzle or patches. That's how you identify, identify it. And then from the ankles down, it's got socks. We cannot see that. We have another two species. We're very fortunate in Kenya. Um, I won't talk much about them. Let's stick to what we have. Yeah, and all of them looks like they're chewing their cud. Yeah, you can see the socks from here but definitely it is a Maasai giraffe. They stand about, you know, 18 feet tall, can weigh up to 1,500 kilos for females. Very good eyesight. They have amazing eyelashes. Look at that, you know, like pointed muzzle, the mouth, unlike most other grazers. This is to be able to penetrate inside bushes. If it was, uh, like, flat or square, it will actually... Um, stop you know like um, interfere with getting into the bushes so when it's pointed it is much easier they also have very prehensile lips uh, like fingers for amazing noses that they open when they want to breathe so that you know leaves don't get inside so everything is properly you know thought of you know long eyelashes for stopping you know, the leaves from getting into the eyes so it's a well thought animal and here looks like they have parked meditating 
and you're chewing the card. Yeah, the, that to the right there is a male. You can tell by its horns, which are not true horns. Horns are made of small hairs called keratin. They're compressed, but these ones, they have skin. They are called ossicons. they bones with the skin around them, so they are not true horns. How you can differentiate between females and male is when you look at the male, the top of the horns are bare and the female looks like a hairbrush. Yeah, that is a male. Those two are males, you can tell that, you know, the thick horns, the top is bare. Yeah, from here, they can, you know, they can look around and uh, make sure there's no danger so they can, you know, chew their card comfortably. Their numbers in Africa are declining. Main threat is poaching and habitat loss. But we are very lucky to still have a very good number of them here in the beautiful Masai Mara. This one here looks like he's looking at me. You know, he knows I'm talking about them. Look at that. He said that um, the lilac breasted roller, the crested crane, and the dodo. Unfortunately, nobody gets the jackpot or to you know the right the right answer. We don't have a national bird in Kenya. We have a national animal, and if you can guess it, I'll be waiting for an answer. We have a national animal. We don't have a national bird. Yes, I'm um, sorry I did twist you there to ask you about a bird. I thought, you know, uh, you'd check it out, but um, thank you for your answers. Okay, I'm gonna stay with my giraffes. They're really like uh, hypnotizing to relax. So I'm gonna relax here a little bit and I'll, you know, see you in a few minutes. We haven't moved, and I'll tell you, my favorite animals in the African bush are elephants. Giraffes are quite interesting. But now, the wildebeest here are coming to have a drink. We all know water is life, and after eating so much, the lulus come to have a drink to help in the digestion. But at the same time, same water is life, we got, you know, the reptiles, the, like the crocodiles that live in this water. So as much as they're having a drink there, they're very, very careful that crocs do not catch them for, you know, one reason or another. We all know crocodiles got very special eyelids that under the water they can open their eyes as they can see what is happening in the outside world. Let's just listen to the calls of this wildebeest here. There must be some communication of some sort. And I always imagine as a person, they are like agreeing and disagreeing. This place is safe to cross? Mm, we do not think so. Okay, let's give it a chance. They come so close to the water and then they change their mind. So, I mean, you never know what happens. But as I said earlier, the best thing to do here is just to be patient and watch and wait. What you hear in the background are hippos. Now, if you look carefully, one group is so close to the water near your screen, and there's a group that has just veered off to the left. So if there's a little feeling that where they want to cross is not safe, they have small little democracies among us themselves, just like the buffaloes. That doesn't sound right, and most likely maybe will end seeing them, all of them moving to the left.
never, I'll tell you, you or rather you won't know that there's a leader who always makes the decision. For the wildebeest, it's always very difficult. And like the buffaloes that you can identify a particular female being like the lead one when they make decisions or when they move, for the wildebeest, even for us who have been out here, you know, in the African wilderness for many years, it's always rather hard to know whether there's a particular leader that makes a decision. But as I said, among us, the wildebeest, we got small little tribes, small little groups. And if a particular group decides this is the way we go, that's the direction they go. Now, Neva, we got this group here. We're still debating whether to cross at this point or not. But the other group that was equally as big have moved to the left. The rivers in all the game parks in Africa have so much action. We got hippos, we got crocs, we got animals drinking, and let's have a look at what happens. Rising on the northwestern edge of the Great Rift Valley and flowing into Lake Victoria some 400 kilometers later, The Mara River is a great vein of life. Running through one of the world's most famous wilderness areas. Shaped and fed by African thunderstorms, rapids, pools and banks provide sustenance to a variety of creatures. For the wildebeest, zebra and gazelle of the Great Migration, the Mara River is a quencher of thirst. And also a fateful test. The herds must cross in search of grazing, but beneath the muddy surface lurks some of the world's largest crocodiles. They have been waiting for the migration for almost a year. For those that survive the rapids, rocks and crocodiles, pastures of sweet red oat grass await. So very true, water is life, but also water can turn out to be something dangerous. Earlier we saw how we lost one calf to a crocodile and this is how they stand and it was rather strange for me when the adults pulled back and they all back tracted the calf either got nervous got in the water and decided to cross so to that calf water is not life but of course it was death and you know to the crocodile that got the croc uh, the calf for breakfast water is life The hippos know this is their home or this is one of the important uh, ecological niche because hippos without water will not be anywhere. So if you look in the background there of your screen, you can see some heads of hippos. I'm sure Bunge may show you that in the back there. It's like they just heard me discussing them. You heard the call there. That call you heard was for the hippo. Apparently, the hippos don't have much to do uh, with the wildebeest. The challenge is always between the wildebeest and the crop. In general, the hippos do not have major interactions or concerns with the wildebeest. The challenges are always between the wildebeests and the crocodiles. Now, these ones that are drinking here must be very thirsty. They're trying to quench their thirst because, I mean, they know the dangers that is in front of them. To try and cross this river, so many things would go wrong. I'm not sure whether they're trying to prepare themselves, to seek themselves before they take the dangerous plunge in the water.
Occasionally, we have noticed once the pressure builds so much from behind, the ones drinking will stop drinking and they'll be pushed in the water and the crossing will start. It's always very difficult to know the position they're going to cross and the time they're going to cross. But again, as I said out here, patience is key. The Mara River is one of the longest rivers that we got in Kenya, and it originates from Kenya, swings through the Masai Mara Game Reserve, then to the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania, and then back to the Masai Mara, and it drains in Lake Victoria. About 400 kilometers long, long or about 250 miles odd. A very important habitat for these two conservation areas, the Masimara and the Serengeti National Park. Very interesting, the ones close or the ones very close to the river bank are pretty young, unlike the others which I would expect to be close there. We'll keep waiting and see what happens. We've been sitting here with these wild dogs waiting to see what's happened. And so far, not a great deal, except they now seem to be moving off towards another spot in the shade. Where I think the adult or the alpha male is. Mm, taking a little piece of food with. Oh, they're so cute. And hyena is still around, if you can believe it. Oh, shame, that little thing's got a limp. That's not great. All right, well, we can move around there and have a better look. Oh, there's a bit of disciplining going on. I don't want to get anyone's way, so let's go this way. I'll just be able to hear them squealing at each other. No. Um. Cranky, no, they will normally finish what they can of whatever kill they make before moving on to catch something else. But you must remember, of course, that they don't, they don't kill necessarily as a pack. So sometimes the pack can kill more than one thing. And then they would have more than one carcass on the go at the same time. But they would then leave that carcass once they'd finished eating, once they'd got full. I've seen two dogs kill a bushbuck once, adult bushbuck ram. They ate what they could and then packed it in. They didn't carry on eating. So it's not like they will hang around a carcass that they haven't, or that, they, you know, that there's still meat on. There's a lot of st stick and bush in the way of this sighting now. Um, I think they're after the hyena again. Oh, or they're after more food. They've taken off at high speed. I have to now try and turn around. <laughs> yes, it's the hyena that's being flattened. It's in here, Thea. I'm just listening, I heard the incredible noise. I'm just gonna move back because we're in their shade. And they were in this shade. There we go, I'm just gonna move back here. So that they can come back to where they were. There we go. 
Should do it. Here we are. Gently coming back. Yes, Megan, their calls are amazing, aren't they? That kind of whooping, twittering. And you would have also heard them bark. You would have heard the bark that they made when that hyena arrived. And I'll probably settle around here for most of the day. when the pack gets too big basically and also when if you've got a large cohort I'm just gonna have to move that's no, fine we don't need to move if there's a large cohort one year you know with lots of females and lots of males they're all related to each other and they will disperse from each other and form a breakaway pack to start with I think often the term breakaway pack is used interchangeably or mistakenly perhaps for dispersal pack or yeah you know any kind of movement away from the an original pack but it's not necessarily a breakaway it could easily be a dispersal but it largely happens when there is an inability to feed the pack because there are too many animals but hyena is still mucking around here wider perspective on what's happening in that situation. Up front, we have the one male, which is the physically bigger male, actually. And he's got a darker mane. And then that one with his head up at the back. That's a physically smaller, lighter male. With a nice yawn from his side. You can see he's already got his head up. He's waiting. Whoa! Getting up. He's probably going to go investigate the female. There's always a little bit of tension. You can see she doesn't look awfully excited. She's not really paying too much attention. And let's see if he gets the idea. Doesn't look like she's going to make any sudden movements or throw herself at him again like we saw earlier. He's also going back down. Maybe it's not time yet. Now what's interesting is it's often said that it's the bigger, darker male. That's the more dominant out of the two and the one that's most likely to mate with the females. But in this case, what I've often noticed is that this male is the one that starts out mating with the females and the other one might move in a little bit later. But I've also seen the two of them fight where this one is actually a little bit more aggressive and he often pushes his brother back to the outskirts. Now I haven't seen any interest from the other brother this far Although both of them and this female that he's mating with were gone from the rest of the pride for the past couple of days. If you have a look at the 
bushes and the grass in the background. You can see the winds blowing quite strongly at this point. And because of that, the whole Pride Society just to lay down here. But have a look at that male constantly scanning around and being quite protective over her. So I think we're going to sit here and see if he changes. Once more, more gnu, more wildebeest, part of the migration, different different location, and different wildebeest, all with a different mission. They are crossing the road, right in front of us. I wonder why, why did the wildebeest cross the road, I may ask myself. Yeah, do we have an answer of the National Animal of Kenya? Okay, uh, these guys, I don't know what mission they have, but there is a swamp to my left. I think that's where they're headed. It is quite a huge herd. A good, uh, maybe, I would give him 10,000. And the yeah, they've stretched a long way. You, you know, Big James will be sharing that with you. But if just, I, I may just tell you, the national animal of Kenya is the lion. We don't have a bird, we just have an animal, and it is a lion. They get comfortable once they get to the other side of the road, and you can see them grazing, yeah, really seriously. Yeah, it's amazing, you know. I hope you're enjoying this. It's one in a lifetime coming live from the Masai Mara. Talk to us. Hashtag CGTN Wild. Hashtag Wild Earth. Questions, comments are very welcome. This is an amazing sight. I hope you are enjoying this as I am. You know, you don't get to see this every day. We have a very short window during the migration when I see this. So I always appreciate, I hope you're doing the same. Yeah. Remember that we haven't seen wild, one wildebeest twice since this morning. Each one of them is different. I have been moving every almost um, 10 minutes. Um, in every segment I've been making, it has been a very different location, believe me. Yeah, they're all different. It looks like there's no wildebeest left in the Serengeti. They're all here. Yeah. All very healthy. Lots of young ones. Yeah, when I tell you about half a million, or sorry, a quarter of a million of them are born during the bathing season, which is February, March, in southern Serengeti, you have to believe me. You see how many young ones are there. And the ones with the slightly carved horns are younglings from last year. You'll see the difference in horns. There's those ones with very sharp straight, and there's those ones with slightly folded ones. Those ones are from last year. Yeah, I don't know if they're gonna be vocal so that I can leave you to enjoy the sounds. Not very much, but please enjoy the sight as um, Big James, you know, shows you how many they are and rolls the camera. And there seems to be plenty nice big elephant bulls here on the Simbambili. We saw two huge ones as we were coming in and they moved off. Now we come here to the dam and one is feasting. All that juicy vegetation will be growing on the sides of the dam wall there. You can see it's really green compared to the rest of the bush. And that's exactly what this bull will be looking for. Now I want you to watch 
watch it eating this branch that it's broken off. There's a little bit of green on it. I wonder if it'll be eating the whole thing or not. William, you'd like to know if elephants prefer, prefer green or dry plants and grass? Definitely green. Definitely. If you can imagine yourself, nice green vegetables are always better. Or nice green leaves. Then dried up ones without any moisture in them. Now I want to watch whether it eats this stick quite carefully because many elephants when they're old will come to the sides, the edges of dams and water area, basically riverine areas or bodies of water where they can eat the softer bits. Plants are nice and juicy. They don't have to do too much chewing. And that's why often we get what's known as elephant grave sites, where lots of elephant bones will be found in one area. And that's a result of old elephants that are, that are at their last cycle of teeth. Maybe they've lost their teeth altogether. Then they'll come to these areas to eat. So I was just watching this guy to see if he'd eat that that branch. Ooh, he's dropped some of it. Because he looks also quite old. If you have a look at the forehead, you'll see that there's these depressions on either side. And then if we have a if we get to have a look at the jaw or the mouth, you'll see that it's also kind of sucked in. Much like when old humans lose their teeth. They too need to eat soft foods. And their cheeks are a little bit sunken. But it seems that this old boy is still able to chew some of the branches at least, so he's definitely still got some teeth. At this time of year, when it's dry, if an elephant discovers a good patch of green like this, you can see there it's really green. No doubt they will spend a lot of time at it. I love the way that they are so gentle with their trunks. I think he's at the tail end of his teeth. He's dropping the bigger bits of the branch into the water and eating the softer, more manageable ones. I'm going to sit with this guy for a little longer. Yeah, welcome back from a wild beast. They're all busy heading somewhere. If you ask me where, I don't know. They always look like they're on a mission. It's like they really know what they're doing. But nobody actually is heading in one direction. Everybody is going in different directions. It's rather interesting to just watch them, you know. I wish you were here, but I'm glad that you are, you know, you are watching. Yeah, this is happening now, 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 now. Yeah, those young ones, they are the same ones that I've been telling you that were born this year, February, March. Very many of them. You know, can you imagine, you know, spending a day as a wildebeest? I cannot imagine, you know, just, you know, wake up, you know, putting your head down, up, left, right, 
then somebody spooks you, you run a little bit, you stop and ask him, why did you run? He doesn't answer you. Then all of a sudden you think there's something, you run. Then, you know, you get tired of running, you sit down, you wake up again, eat. Then you think you're thirsty and you think your friend you know, knows where the water is, you follow him. Then you end up being chased, you get lost. And oh my God, I cannot imagine. It's a very, very, very interesting life, and that's why I, um, I think I am human and they are wildebeest. Pam, you ask if they cross the river and then cross back the same place? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that question because I have seen that happen and not only once but a few times where they come in a haste like they really want to cross, they get across, then 20 minutes later same group turns around and crosses back and then even the third time a few of the ones that are crossed maybe if they were about uh, 200 maybe another 50 lose their mothers lose their calves and they decide to cross back i have seen that believe me and it does happen hopefully me and david in the next coming weeks we'll be able to share that we might forget that you know you ask but you know watch this space stay tuned you might get to see it i might forget but you know you might get you might see it yeah they do cross and crisscross that is how many they are this is slightly a different angle from what i shared with you earlier and uh, you know it's just wildebeest 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 as far as you can see it's amazing sight yeah one that everybody should see in his lifetime if they could because it's it, you know it's not seen anywhere else apart here apart from here in the Masai Mara look at those ones top right they are walking you know top right and then when they reach uh, outside the angle we cannot see they turn around and turn left this is what is interesting about wildebeest you never know what they are thinking they have a mind of their own the one good thing that happens to them is that they have a survival strategy where they know if we give birth to many of us we will never go extinct so you know they give birth to a quarter of a million every year of those quarter of a million maybe hundred thousand reach maturity many of them die of exhaustion during the first journey up here crossing the river drowning being taken by crocodiles not to mention thirst and also predators do take them so reaching adulthood which is about four years maybe about hundred thousand will reach maturity looks like they're more and more heading to the top right over there i'm gonna relocate slightly and um, hope you know you're gonna have fun enjoying a little bit of this so those wildebeest in the mora certainly do have a turbulent lifestyle with all of the predators and one of those predators would be this lion. Now, its life doesn't look that turbulent at this point. And you can see he's almost falling half asleep. You can see his head's dipping a little bit. He's just enjoying that bit of warm sunlight that's just come through the clouds. But he is currently and this whole morning so far, been mating with the female that's close to him. You can see now he's woken up. Let's see what he does. He might get up in a minute or two to turn around towards her side and see if she's ready to mate another time. But for him to get to this position or to this stage in his life as a mature male able to mate with 
females in the area. He had to go through quite a lot of challenges in life. A big predator like this, they often get a lot of pressure from others within their own species. And it's truly a feat to reach this mature age and being able to mate and sire your own offspring. And even mate and sire your own offspring in front of your other offspring. See, he's just turned his head slightly. And what we're actually seeing here is a lot of very subtle hints from the male towards the female and the other way around. They are communicating even though they're not physically making any noises. Or even really looking at each other. Even though he looks completely unaware of what's happening around him, he's very, very aware of every move. Every time she moves, every time she rolls around, he knows. And that's why he's still sitting upright with his head ready to make a move. Now this morning we've been timing them and they've more or less had intervals of 15 minutes between every mating session. It's getting a little bit hotter now, so it might take a little bit longer and longer. And they might even stop for a while during the heat of the day. Now it's difficult to see, to see clearly, but the female's laying down in the shade that little tree on the termite mound right behind them. And they've chosen that open patch, which looks like an eroded down termite mound. And over there they've spent most of their time this morning. After a while he starts drifting around and he looks at birds and things moving past to pass the time. Welcome back. Yeah, with meeting lions is always a mating game, you know, a waiting game. Yeah, our wildebeest looks like they are still migrating. They are going and going and going. This is another different angle I decided to give you of the same wildebeest, of course, from a few minutes ago. And they are coming and going behind me. Looks like they are on a mission. There is a crossing below what we call Kichwa Tembo airstrip. And I think that's where they're headed. So it's going to be a mission for me either this afternoon or tomorrow to see if they're going to cross. I didn't get the name. Yes, they are Aunt John Samnam. Uh, sorry about your name, but... Um, they are related to antelopes, but more a subfamily of the bovids, which are related to a domestic animals. You know, the cows, the goats, the sheep. They are more related to that. But it is an antelope, yes. Yeah, mission impossible. We don't know where they're going. <laughs> Look at that all coming from the horizon it looks like they're bubbling from a volcano you look you know if you look way back there 
it's uh, beyond what I can see. So they're just coming up and they keep coming and coming. Remember, they, are, they just arrived here. They were not here. They're only about three miles from here yesterday. And so I think the smell of fresh grass is really pushing them to, to come as many as possible. Uh, Andrea, did you say it's a beautiful scene? Indeed, it is a beautiful scene. One that, you know, you cannot compare with anything else anywhere. I don't know if you can hear their gnawing. I'll leave you to listen to that a little bit. This particular bird is not showing us his best angle, but it is worth just having a look. This is a Marshall Eagle, and we saw it coming down from some distance away with its legs out, wings folded up in a diving posture or sort of a sort of parachuting posture, and I think it missed whatever it was attacking. And now it is sitting here looking a bit depressed and irritated. This is the biggest eagle we get here, heaviest and tallest and biggest wingspan. Immensely powerful bird. And whatever escaped being gripped by those fearsome talons can consider itself very lucky indeed. Typical August wind is starting to come up as the warmth builds a little bit. And I'm sure the bird will take to the skies again fairly soon to see if it can't catch something else. It's quite difficult to imagine how it is that this bird is able to catch, given how big it is and that it's in the sky and therefore pretty obvious but clearly it has its ways and means. This old bull is still busy nibbling. Isn't he just beautiful? Now you can see he's quite old because he's got a very defined hourglass shape See the forehead and the tusks come out very wide between the eyes and between the tusks. What a beautiful boy. He's just having a wonderfully peaceful time at the dam here, much like myself. lovely. Now we are talking about the teeth. Elephants have a molar in each quadrant of their jaw. Look at that. And those will be replaced six times in their lifetime. I would say, if I had to estimate the age of this bull, given the depressions in his forehead and the width between his eyes and tusks, I'd say he's in his 50s. Butterfly, you say he looks great for his age? I couldn't agree more. I think he looks fantastic. I think he looks wizened to the world. Look at 
him moving through. He's had enough to eat now. Oh, you can see just how big he is. These old bulls, they move so deliberately and carefully. Really are gentle giants. Hello, big boy. Looks like he's going to come closer to us to say goodbye. As we have come to that time of the show. Come on, come tell everyone. Come tell everyone. Bye-bye. He's just checking us out. You can see he's very, very calm, relaxed, quite at peace after his meal at the dam. Much like I am, and I hope that you all are, after this epic drive this morning, we had some wonderful wild dogs, all those puppies, epic sightings of them and the hyenas, some wonderful elephants and those lions. Here he comes. Hello, big boy. You are spectacular. We have had an exciting morning, you all. Thank you so much. And again, join us tomorrow, same time, same place. See what happens for CGTN's Digital Safari.